Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining me again, friend. Absolutely. My pleasure, friend. So uh, there's a lot that I would love to get into today to sort of continue our last conversation. But maybe to start, I will ask you, um, you had a tweet. You quote tweeted me recently. I was quote tweeting Luli. And you said, what questions do you have about applied memetics and or memetic literacy? And I asked you several questions, which you kindly answered in text, but I thought I would give you the opportunity to answer things in that direction sort of verbally. And just uh, in particular, um, yeah, maybe the second question I asked, which is what should everyone know about memes? Uh, what the sort of 101 level, tell me what I need to know about memes. <laughs> oh man, that's, that is a, um, it is a good question. Um, I remember having this this feeling of I really should be able to answer this. There's like, oh, this is the core thing, but it's like, ah. Uh. So there's so on one level, I so I'll, I'll try to answer it at more the object level, but I think it's worthwhile to notice for the question itself mm -hmm. uh, that um, if if you were if a um, if like a three year old were able to ask that question about normal literacy. Like what are the things I need to know about how to read? There's there's a little bit of a like, there's something funny about the question. Mm -hmm. like, I think I can answer the question of sort of like what things to focus on and why you might wanna do it. Mm. And those are good things to be aware of. But the main thing is actually more like a skill and that the skill opens up something. Mm. So I think there's a, a close analogy there. Yeah, you could you could answer that question instead. I mean, part of it is like um, to use the metaphor. Uh, it feels a bit like um, I'm illiterate, and I'm like, so what is this reading thing good for anyway? Like, it sounds like it could be good, but I'm not quite sure what it's good for. So pretend I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I don't think I could give a good explanation of why mimetic literacy would be a good thing, even though it's, it sounds good. I'm like here for it, but I would love to hear you. Say more about that. I'm sure, reading probably the, the, the vibes are positive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I came up with. Uh, um, I actually wrote a Facebook post on this that I think did a, a, a pretty good explanation of that. So I'll basically repeat the idea that I put there. Um, one way to see it is that human beings are not actually on the top of the food chain. Uh, there is, um, there is a. Like, I find myself wanting to wanting to add caveats before I say the thing, but I'm, I'll, I'll say the thing first and they allow it to sound awfully weird. And then I'll add corrections for people who have excessive woo allergies. Mm. Um, or of course, it's not excessive if you're hearing this and you have a woo allergy. <laughs> but anyway, so the um, uh, there are living creatures, living beings that are massively larger than human scale, massively more powerful than human scale, and that essentially view our life force as food. That uh, this is what defines the course of what humanity does or doesn't do, and that our ignorance of this encourages a particular kind of environment um, it creates a particular kind of environment that encourages a certain species of these creatures to thrive more than another type. Uh, the type that it encourages to uh, thrive tends to not care about humans, and that creates a lot of problems. So learning to see this picture clearly uh, without having to just use metaphors, but actually see it for yourself is, uh, I think, critical for the human race to become sane and kind. So to um, to de weird that you look like you want to jump in. Yeah, no, de, de weird it for me. Okay. So when I say uh, living creatures, uh, you could say that I am using a metaphor, but it's in the same way that um, if I say that a dog or a tree is a living creature, that it's a metaphor. The um, you, you could run with that and go, well, I'm not saying that there's, there's actually a soul in the dog that is separate from its molecular patterns. I'm describing a kind of intuition that is, you know, it's like, are you describing something ontologically real about the dog or about the tree when you say that it's alive? 
some people would argue yes, some no, but it's like, you know, we can sidestep that question and say biology is the correct subject to use to look at those rather than physics, even though you're not making a claim that they do something that is in defiance of physics. Okay. So uh, the thing that's making living creatures be what they are, and one, one way to frame it is that they are um, patterns, uh, they are, they are um, self-repairing, self-replicating um, molecular structures. Now, whether those molecular structures are at the molecular scale, as you do with like bacteria, bacteria are literally at the molecular scale, same with um, uh, viri. Uh, human cells have this kind of structure. Uh, but the thing that defines a dog is actually a system of systems. And so you can, you can see this pattern and go, well, you know, instead of breaking it all the way down to what exactly the carbon atoms are doing, which is a worthwhile thing to be able to do, we're going to step back and recognize it makes sense to talk about dogs and dog behavior. You don't talk about um, molecular chemistry when you're trying to figure out how to train a dog. So the things that I'm talking about when I say that there are creatures that are much larger, much more vast than the human scale, um, I mean it in exactly the same way. They are self-sustaining, self-replicating patterns to the extent that you can use the quote unquote metaphor of a dog having desires, which I think is a perfectly sane thing to say, if anything can have desires, a dog can have desires. Uh, these creatures have desires. Hmm. The the, the, the main difference is that they're not made of molecules the same kind of way that a dog or a tree is. Um, they're more analogous to an ant colony, which technically the ant colony is made of molecules, but the thing that defines the colony is a pattern that, that, uh, that supersedes the, uh, the molecular physical structure. So in that kind of way, some quick examples, like I think people intuit this stuff pretty easily when they talk about what the US government should do as though the government is an entity. And the entity has desires and it does. You can look at its desires and see it as sort of um, uh, the, uh, <laughs> if, if, if you look at its revealed preferences, uh, it's primarily interested in uh, survival retaining power in order to ensure its survival um, and retaining its ability to uh, collect taxes and tell people what to do. It was like the basic function of almost any government. And then all of the other things that it does are sort of extraneously slapped on top of that based on what constraints do you give it. Mm -hmm. Like the constitution being a constraint for the US government and that makes it do certain things in order to survive. Um, Black Lives Matter is another example of one of these hyper creatures one of these uh, non-physical entities. And it's, um, it's a little weird to say that these things don't exist because you can't describe them the way you can describe a rock. Uh, I think this is part of the kind of uh, the, the, the paradigm bias that we live in today, where if it's not physical, it's not real. Uh, then you run into problems of, okay, well, is the Pythagorean theorem real? Hmm. Uh, your, your definition of real has some real problems. <laughs> but if, if we're going to acknowledge that we can get insight by seeing a certain type of structure and treating the structure as having, like, like when you say, okay, life requires carbon or something equivalent to carbon in order to function the ways that we're familiar with. Like this is a pattern that if you replicate on a computer, still allows you to observe life, even though you're dealing with a simulation of carbon atoms, not literal physical carbon atoms. So same kind of thing, when you're looking at these patterns, you, it makes sense to view, um, view Black Lives Matter as having intent and having strategies for survival and strategies for spreading. There's a reason why we talk about um, articles that spread throughout the internet as going viral it's actually, it's, it's not just a close analogy, it's the identical structure. It is literally viral. It, it injects itself into a person's mind and propels them to spread its code such that it injects into others' minds and propels them to spread its code. It's exactly the same structure as when a virus injects its RNA into the replication mechanisms of a cell that results in the creation of more viri. So, um, 
So when I'm talking about these hyper creatures, um, I mean something very grounded. It's just grounded in a way of viewing things that it's a necessary consequence of the materialist frame, but it's not one that we're used to using. And the one of the there, there are a couple of reasons I care about this deeply. One of them is that um, one of them has to do with uh, power scale, which is that the um, the things that an individual human can do are fairly limited. Like one of the biggest things that a human being can build on their own is a house. And that's pretty hard. Like you have to be really skilled and have a lot of energy. And, uh, and, this, and when I say can, I don't just mean are physically capable of it. I mean, actually can. Like somebody might be in theory capable of building a skyscraper, uh, a skyscraper on their own. But in practice, they don't actually have the capacity to develop the resources physically or emotionally to be able to sustain the effort needed to build a skyscraper themselves, even if they could physically manage it. Um, so, uh, and houses are really hard. In practice, it's mostly these hyper creatures that build houses in the forms of companies. So, um, the things, so if you look at, and it, if you take everything that happens at a scale larger than a house, and you view that as the action of these hyper creatures, the actions of these hyper creatures, uh, you can see that basically everything that we care about is governed by them. So the question of what are they doing and how do we orient to them? This is in some sense, the only question that matters on the global scale. I mean, it's, it's a way of framing the only question that matters on the global scale. It's not that you have to view it this particular way, but I think this is a particularly clear way of viewing it. Uh, these creatures are made of means the same way that living creatures are made of genes, so to speak. Um, it's the, the analogy isn't exact. It might be better to say that uh, the way that living creatures are made of cells, that might be a little bit closer. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's actually a closer analogy. We don't actually have the analog of a gene for memetics, despite the name mapping. Um, but uh, the, the thing is that the memes work, memet the whole structure of memetics works through the minds of humans. So the, um, this means that our understanding of these hyper creatures is part of how they work. And currently the way that works is ignorance. We, we actually just don't see them. We don't understand them. Occasionally we get this glimpse and you find this in intuitions like the government should blah, 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 treating the government as an entity. But the assertion, yeah, the government should create universal basic income. Uh, the fact is that on the inside, people are not used to tracking how there should does or does not connect to what the hyper creature does or does not do. They don't even know why they're saying the should. They think it's because they have some opinion that the opinion is disconnected from reality. They don't see the situation in enough detail to know what is even possible, what the US government can or can't do. So instead what's happening is these hyper creatures uh, are moving through people's minds and possessing them, kind of like cordyceps for ants. Hmm. And, um, the idea of, oh, the government should create universal basic income is actually a form of possession. Hmm. Most people have no awareness at all of how possessed they are by how many of these creatures, let alone what those creatures' intent are. And part of the reason for that is if you were aware of it, it would prevent some of the propagation methods. So there is convergent evolutionary desire or design, I guess I should say, convergent evolutionary design on the part of many, many, many of these hyper creatures to distract people from the clarity of this. Now, as, as I'm saying this, I'm, I'm zooming in on the uh, don't give a fuck about humans species of these things. There's another species that I can go into. Um, but to me, orienting to this, recognizing literacy about what's going on in the world, enough that you can watch the possession happening in real time 
in yourself and in other people, and that you can just become conscious of it. This to me is essential. It is an absolute requirement. It is an absolute necessity for the human race to become sane and kind. Hmm. So when I say mimetic literacy, I mean, just notice. Hmm. So you'll see me tagging this a lot in my, in my uh, tweets. I'll often end with just notice because I'm not trying to drive a call to action because that's often a form of possession. Mm. What I'm trying to do is gesture towards, if you pay attention, you can see this for yourself. And when you see enough, you will grow your remembrance of your center from which you are unpossessable. And then you can sort of disinfect yourself, so to speak. Mm. Can you say more about the two kinds of species, the ones that don't care about humans and the ones that do? Sure. So I got this basically right from uh, David Deutsch when he talks about um, rational and anti-rational means. Um, I, I credit him with lighting up my awareness that this is a really important area. Um, I get the impression I've taken it farther than he has, but I'm not sure. Um, I've definitely taken it in a slightly different direction. Um, although I haven't talked with him directly about it, but I wanna give him credit for the, for the initial seed. So um, I, I should also, <laughs> to, to, to de-weird anything about him, he doesn't talk about these as creatures at all, at all. But I think that it is, um, to, if we're going to pretend that dogs are creatures, I think it's fine to, to pretend that these are, like exactly the same logic. <clears throat> um, so the two species are, uh, they basically, one, one way to cut the difference is whether, so it's like, like how, how do they propagate? Like what is their sexual strategy, so to speak? Um, they're not actually at the stage where uh, you could reliably describe it as sexual um, reproduction. Um, it's, uh, it's more like, um, well, I could, go in, I could go into the mutation strategy. There, there really is a way you can zoom in and be really careful about this is how evolutionary theory applies to memes and you can see the mechanisms. But uh, at the core, just like with biology, the replication strategy is the core thing. So if you zoom in on what is the replication strategy? One of them, the strategy is, like, like, the, the thing to bear in mind is uh, what defines whether any meme spreads and whether, whether, uh, whether it spreads in a competitive environment, which is to say, if it's competing for a resource, which is usually a particular slot in the belief structure of a human mind. If they're competing for um, such a slot in the human mind, the thing that um, defines which one wins on net is whether it is better at uh, causing its own dissemination as a result of it being received than the others that it's competing with. It's like, like baseline evolutionary theory. So the strategy on the part of what I sometimes think of as the stupefying hyper creatures, the ones that are, uh, that don't care about humans. I keep on wanting to say anti-human, but that's stronger than what I mean. Um, they, uh, they view humans as a resource kind of the same way that we treat our cells for the most part. We need our cells, but we don't serve our cells mm. by default. Mm. So these, um, these hyper creatures uh, make it, uh, do what they can to stun the mind of their host in such a way that the injection of the idea, the injection of the, of the mimetic code, um, together with the stunning structure, uh, will render the person incapable of not replicating the stun and disseminate method. Mm. Right. So uh, examples of this, probably the, one of the easiest examples of this, it's a little fictional, but I think that it's, it's helpfully clear. Uh, when you look at transgenerational uh, alcoholism. Um, <clears throat> there's a specific type of pattern that I'm going to make it overly specific. This is the part that's fictional. Um, but I think the specificity helps to see the structure. Uh, if you imagine that a, um, a father, alcoholic, has a kid, um, uh, the kid comes up to 
the alcoholic father and asks one of their why questions. They're about four years old and are like curious about stuff. And uh, the father turns and backhands the kid and says, don't ask stupid questions. Okay, so not just that incident, but the entire structure that the kid is in is going to associate in their little bodies fear with curiosity. They're also, do, do you need a moment here? I can see your hand. No, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Just, yeah, please continue. Okay. They also don't have the ability to regulate their nervous system. So they're easily overwhelmed and they often stay in this overwhelmed state. But they have a model, particularly as they get older, and they're layering strategies of avoiding their feelings because if they can dissociate a little bit, that they can do something that looks kind of like regulation. This sort of um, functional freeze, as Irene Lyon calls it, is a, a very common state for most people. Uh, it's just very clear for the adult children of alcoholics. They, they have a very acute trauma that's sitting in their system. When they get a little bit older and can access alcohol, they have the model from their parent of a way to regulate. And this is how children learn how to regulate. They, they model their parents. So they know they can turn to the bottle. So and this kind of works because the alcohol will sort of numb their system and make them a little dissociated. And it's hard for the parts of them that hurt to speak and be heard clearly, especially if they're trying to ignore it. So then this kid grows up into an adult and then is, um, and then hooks up with somebody, has a kid, and then is sitting there watching the TV and their kid comes up and asks, why is blah, blah, blah? which exactly pokes the fear, like the curiosity fear bundle that was associated to them when they were a, a young kid. And the way that they know to deal with it is whack, don't ask stupid questions. So there we've just described the life cycle of a living thing. The same way you could talk about um, Caterpillar goes, eats, leaves, be, goes into a cocoon, emerges as a butterfly, goes and mates with uh, another thing, then uh, lays eggs or, or just dies, depending on which sex it is. Uh, and then those eggs hatch and eventually grow up to be caterpillars. You describe the life cycle of a living creature. So the, when you actually look at the, the structure of transgenerational trauma, um, for one thing, it becomes really obvious that the humans are not to blame. Blame is actually an anti-helpful structure, an anti-helpful lens for understanding what's going on. You can just look at it and see this is a creature that is trying to survive and is using human beings as its host, as its, as its, um, as its infrastructure, as the environment in which it grows. And the way that it survives is that it makes sure that the behaviors that ensure its transmission, whack, that those behaviors are incapable of being inhibited hmm. by the nature of the transmission. Okay. So that's one family of them. And sadly, the more you learn how to see this stuff clearly, the more obvious it becomes, this is the bedrock of modern civilization. The idea is, um, like I've, I'm currently working on, on, uh, on uh, building a sort of a corrective math course that addresses this kind of thing. It's my, my PhD is in mathematics education. Um, um, but uh, one, one of the criticisms that I have to bring to bear on math classes is that they're, they basically don't teach math at all. Mm. Uh, what they teach is computation. And they do so in a way that is designed and, and I say it's designed in the way that anything evolutionary is designed. This is desi hyper-creature design. It is designed to alienate students from their inner knowing hmm. with threat and demands for obedience, often in ways that don't make sense. Like the kids often don't care about the problems that they're faced with. They don't care about the solution methods that they're learning, but you have to learn because otherwise you won't graduate. And, and this sort of implication of you're kind of stupid if you do, can't do this. Mm. And even the side of, um, oh, you're doing so well, that makes you so smart. Mm. That's actually 
it, it's encouraging you to outsource your sense of validity and, um, and value to a reflection that is controlled outside of you. So it is still alienating from your inner knowing. And the actual soul of mathematics, and math and mathematics is actually a study of, of something in the other species of hypercreatures. So I'm gonna to touch on that in some more detail. But the, um, but this, this um, the essence of mathematics is about training and deepening your mastery of emanating from and relating to your unalienable knowing. So like when I say math classes don't teach math, I mean, like, <laughs> like they're, they're, they're teaching uh, trauma. Like there's, there's math trauma is built into the structure. Um, and uh, this is like, despite the golden intentions of teachers and administrators and uh, researchers and ev basically everybody involved, I think they want to do good by the kids, um, but they can't because the sources of creativity required in order to envision a different way of teaching this stuff in a way that would catch the essence um, would actually challenge the reproductive capabilities of stupefying hyper creatures. So um, again, it's, it's helpful to see through the lens of intent. The, the hyper creatures do not want to allow that. So you'll find systematically um, that people's creativity in this direction is numbed and stunned. If somebody comes up with something novel, uh, it, uh, it can often run into weird bureaucratic limitations. Um, it can sound creepy or weird. Uh, when I, one of the reasons I left academia was because uh, it became really obvious to me that like we had revolutionary methods of teaching math in a way that bypassed all of this stuff in the 1970s from something called cognitively guided instruction. We knew how to solve the, the, the problem of teaching math well, such that it actually uh, invigorates the human soul and makes people um, very competent at solving math problems, even if that was all that you cared about. It was, it was at least as good as the standard methods, but it couldn't get disseminated. And the reason it couldn't get disseminated was basically, it was, it was for a cluster of reasons, but it had to do with um, the motivation of politicians is um, based on how they are seen by the electorate. Um, motivation of parents, like parents often have a lot of math trauma. And so if they're presented with a bunch of stuff that their, their kid is bringing home that the parents can't do at all, this also affects things about how they relate to the power structure of them being superior to their children, which is itself another stupefying mimetic structure. Um, uh, they can end up feeling like, well, like, uh, like why aren't you teaching the kids multiplication tables? And the reason is multiplication tables uh, numb the mind. That's, they're, they're not, like if, if you need them, your desire for them will naturally emanate from within and you'll learn them because they matter. Um, so, there's just like tons of stuff like this where you end up with this interlocked system. And I could go into more detail about the interlocking, but the net effect is you can't actually disseminate the method because it's disbelieved in and can't get enough funding and can't get enough support to actually go through the school system. This is not the only example. It, it, it's systematic. It is, uh, if there were anybody in the center designing it, it would be well designed to prevent meaningful innovation. This is just in education. You could say the same thing about the structure of voting. You could say the same thing about what uh, our inability to do anything for climate change. These, these structures, it, it, you, you don't need conspiracies to see how this stuff arises. There might be conspiracies, I'm not dismissing them, but most people, most people are quick to believe in conspiracies due to mimetic illiteracy. Mm. They don't see that the mimetic structure is sufficient to explain what's going on. And that has implications about what you and I and each one of us can actually do about it and what we can't do about it. Mm -hmm. right? It's not a matter of finding the right villains because you, you've just passed the buck. Why are the villains villainous? How did they get that way? Why did their villainy work? It hasn't answered the question at all. 
So that's that's one family, uh, and it's it's arguably the most important one. <laughs> um, in, this, in the sense of developing medical literacy, because if all you do is you see this, then it's possible to do a thing that's kind of like awakening. I think a lot of the stuff that people like, um, uh, Jesus and the Buddha, um, Lao Tzu, I think a lot of what they were talking about was recognizing this kind of stuff, the way that it defines who we think we are and how we function. If you were to just, <laughs> nearly, quote unquote, um, if you were to just purify yourself of that influence and find your center, and if that were a cultural standard, we, you know, in a very important sense, meta would become the foundation of everything we do, mm -hmm. and we would be done mm -hmm. in terms of creating heaven on earth. We, mm -hmm. Like there would be problems to solve, but we would be working together on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can I you recognize give, I haven't gone into the other one, but yeah, I'm please. That yeah, can space. you give an example of the other one? Sure. So the other propagation method. So remember, this is the, the core of this, the core of the stupefying hyper creature. By the way, I've, I've often referred to egregores, uh, which is the same thing. Mm -hmm. A hyper creature um, is a reference to, I forget the guy's name, but there was somebody who came up with the term hyper object. Um, which is a thing that is so large that it is beyond the, um, the scope of a human mind to normally be able to orient to, that you can't find specific instances of it anywhere, and yet it is still there. Climate change being a con concrete example. Um, you can see its effects on net, but you can't see any specific example and say, this is because of climate change. Um, so hyper creatures are like that. They're sort of an order above us, the same way that ant eaters are an order above ants. And ants literally cannot understand anteaters um but there's like you know they're, they're still very relevant <laughs> if ants can orient to anteaters that's important to do so um so the the main thing for egregores for these hyper creatures this bit about propagation method the stupefying strategy is stupefy to stun the mind in such a way to creating trauma in such a way that it disables any capacity to do anything that would interfere with the continuation of the life cycle. That's the core strategy. The core strategy of this other one, um, which it corresponds to what David Deutsch would refer to as rational means. Um, I think of them as a clarifying means. So they encourage clarity. And the reason is their propagation strategy is based on having something of actual value to the host and demonstrating that clearly such that the host's natural desires cause them to want to take it on. Which then works through compassion as its propagation medium. So um, one example, uh, this is not my usual default one, but an easy example is meta. Mm -hmm. Like it displays itself and to the extent that you are uh, willing to look at it and understand it, you can come to recognize, of course, I want this. Mm -hmm. And it shapes itself not to get you to do it, mm -hmm. but instead to help you see that you want to, mm -hmm. so that the choice is coming from within rather than you trusting something outside of yourself. And you want to spread it too. Yeah. And furthermore, the act of cultivating it makes you want to spread it more, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is this is a beautiful example of um, of a symbiotic possession. Calling it possession is awfully weird in this case, but I like I, I don't have a better term for it. It is definitely symbiosis. That's very mm -hmm. clear, um, as opposed to parasitic, which is the other kind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, meta works through and with a human mind in order to come up with more creative ways to offer people meta. Mm. So it is actually using the intelligence of its hosts in order to better propagate itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is, if you watch it, it's the same thing that happens with the parasitic hyper creatures. But what they're doing is uh, optimizing for um, 
the ability to route around weaponry and to inject forcibly. Mm. So you see this, for instance, in the rhetoric around what happened with Roe versus Wade. And they, like some of the, because most, most of my info bubble, to the extent that, I, that people talk about it, uh, I tend to hear more people from the left than the right. And so there, I hear these things like, um, uh, oh, so now women are going to be forced to um, to bring their child to term, but we can't get any child support or sufficient maternity leave. Mm. If you if you listen to the intent behind that kind of rhetoric, first off, uh, usually this is a received argument. You've heard it from somewhere else, which is why you repeat it. Mm. It's rarely you've spontaneously recognized this. That's not how most people work in this kind of mimetic environment. Mm. But the intent of it is to stun. It is meant to create a physiological alarm response in the listener. If you are already infected with this possession, if this particular hyper creature, and, the, and the, I want to be clear, the hyper creature I'm referring to here is not pro-choice. That's its name. Hmm. Right? If you actually look at what it's trying to do, it's actually, it would actually be devastating to its survival mechanism for pro-choice to win completely. It is actually key to its survival strategy that it be fighting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that it have, an, it have an enemy, which is the pro-life side, and vice versa. So this is sort of like um, uh, the couple who uh, gets in fights all the time and then uh, has a makeup sex. And like, this is how they turn each other on. Like mm -hmm. the, it's, a, it's a pattern kind of like that. Mm -hmm. So the, these arguments that are about, so you're gonna force women to bring a child to term, but you're not going to create this kind of support needed to raise the child. It's, it's framed in a way that's meant to be alarming. It's not asking for clarity. It's not saying, hey, I am scared and hurt because I feel this sense of force being pressed on me. And I think it's important for this to be present in the conversation as we sort out a way for us to work together to create a sane and kind environment for everyone. It's not that tone at all. So the essence of it is very much using human intelligence to construct arguments that are designed to strike in ways that perpetuate the argument and either create a sense of, yeah, 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 if you're already infected, or a sense of, that's not fair, listen to these stupid people if, it's, if you disagree, but you're infected with its mate, mm. Mm. right? That's that whole thing. So it's actually hijacking human intelligence in order to come up with more elaborate argument structures. You contrast this with the attempts of teachers and practitioners to find ways of making meta more accessible and clearer to people. It's the same thing, but it's symbiotic in a very powerful way. And that's what's making it pro-human. Its foundation is exactly the recognition that the exaltation of the host is the propagation method. Mm. So that's one example. What's the usual example that you would give to someone that's not Tosh and not the meta example? <laughs> uh, uh, physics. Mm. Like the first one that comes to mind for me is uh, the uh, Maxwell's equations. Um, this is, um, now this one is usually it's tricky because you have to get past math trauma in order to see this one. So math trauma mm -hmm. dips into the, the stunning category. But if you can unweave math trauma and related STEM trauma uh, and see the true thing underneath, what's happening is uh, things like Maxwell's equations are showing you the deep, true structure of reality in a way that allows you to interact with it more powerfully. So this is not useful for most people in a day-to-day -day fashion. Most people don't need to know Maxwell's equations. Um, but if you're an electrician, having an intuition, or if you, if you might be interested in becoming an electrician, having an intuition for the actual structure of these things is precious. It's important. It's valuable. You can get away with just having a, um, a, uh, a, a practitioner's skill set of just like, well, don't, don't lick the wire. <laughs> Make sure you're wearing rubber boots. Like you can have a bunch of random facts like this. Um, but there's something 
I, and, and these things, these things are arguably small examples. Sometimes people do them because they were told to, and sometimes they do it because they get why. When they get why, these are other small examples. And I, I can give some, a, a couple of clearer ones like that in a minute. Um, but uh, to the extent that you can, uh, you can make your perception of reality deeper in a way that you can see for yourself is true. That truth becomes importantly unassailable. And so it doesn't matter if, for instance, if cancel culture comes around and says, yeah, but Maxwell's equations are created by a bunch of oppressive white people, some of which are beneficiaries of slavery, so we can't trust this. Like they can babble all they want to, but that's still true. Hmm. That truth has a purity to it that you can make yours. It's not received. I mean, you, you, you're in, it's, it's inspired by reception. But when you make it yours, done. Hmm. Absolutely done. So there, there are lots of, um, lots of smaller examples that show up along these lines. Uh, there's, some, there's some simple ones that are almost, that it's hard to distinguish between biology, like uh, your children matter. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or maybe more generally, children matter. And uh, this one seems like it's sort of obvious that this would be an idea that would propagate in a human race because if they don't care about their children, those cultures didn't survive. But there's a question of what is the engine behind it? Mm. If the engine behind it is um, for the children, mm. right, that has this stunning nature to it which is you'd better believe it. We're repeating this line. You're, you, know, you love children, don't you? Oh, of course, I adore children. When you feel like you, you can't admit that when kids are first born, they look like ugly rats. You know, and, you know there's like, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing of, if it is forbidden to suggest that kids are actually sometimes kind of annoying and you want nothing to do with them. Mm. Like when there's a sense of it is forbidden to admit something, you know you're dealing with a stupefying structure. Mm -hmm. But when there is clarity about these are souls, like whatever ontology you want to use, whether you believe in literal souls or not, doesn't matter. These are beings that are coming into the, our world and are bringing in a particular sort of freshness and they will outlive us mm -hmm. and they will bring their own children. There's a, there's a thing of if you can feel this and it connects with your sense of mattering. When you care about the future of humanity, which of course our children are our future, you can have those as a bunch of associated word concept fragments. A fragmented understanding is another uh, signal that you're probably dealing with a stupefying mimetic structure. But if it's inextricable from your perception, the same way that it's inextricable from my perception of you that you have a nose. This mm -hmm. isn't a separate fact about Tashi, right? If, it's, if it is inextricable from my care about the legacy of what impact I have, from my having lived, uh, from what kind of world we build, whether we create a same kind human race, that this is utterly inextricable from the existence of and care for children. When it's that wedded, it becomes very obvious that this is, a, this is integral to humanity and to what it means to care. And I don't have to have the idea forced on me any more than I have to have the idea that you have a nose forced upon me. It's just, it's there. But then it has implications, such as not traumatizing kids in ways that propagate stupefying memes is actually extremely important. Mm. It's hard to underemphasize how important it is, but it's easy to over push how important it is. Mm -hmm. Right. So like feeling out some of these things of, oh, actually, th this is the perspective I come from of saying, uh, in short, schools are bad. But it's, it's, it's not uh, an assertion about the purpose or that they need to change their education methods in some particular way. It's that 
the rise of educational institutions and of mandatory education, its primary evolutionary function is to destroy the inner knowing of children so that they can be automatons of culture, so that we can have a civilization. And that is its evolutionary function. So there is a big, big question that um, I, I, I can feel on the, on the conversational winds. It's, it's saturated everywhere. You hear this in terms of game B or uh, Malcolm talks about uh, humanity three. Um, uh, he's borrowed from me uh, the, uh, the third generation mimetic operating system or gen three, which is a reference to the same kind of thing, which is this question of how do you have a civilization that is based on clarifying mimetic structures? Um, I have some clear visions of that um, that we can uh, go into, but the um, to just take a step back, the uh, the point of like the ultimate point coming back for mimetic literacy. Why mimetic literacy is that it highlights awareness of this stuff. Mimetic literacy itself is a clarifying mimetic structure, and as such, it has a lot to say about itself. Which is, let me be clear about where this is coming from not to force it on you, but just to show you so that if and when you're ready, this is something that you can step into and we'll see what we can do to make this as easy as possible within reason and within other constraints because context is infinitely rich. That that provides, from what I can tell, the core shift that is needed to make it so that the mimetic environment of the human race stops being primarily supportive of stupefying egregores and starts becoming primarily supportive of clarifying ones. I'm reminded of um, the three poisons from Buddhism, greed, hatred, and ignorance. And I'm imagining that you could describe them in this term as sort of fuel for the stupefying egregores or the anti-rational memes or uh, the ones that don't care about humans, is that accurate? Or would you add nuance to that or say something different entirely? I think that's accurate. I think there's a lot more to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, but the short version is I just agree. Yep, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's fuel. Feel free um, to say more. I'd love to hear whatever you had to say. Cool. Um, I will. The, 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 the fuel structure is always the human body. Mm. Um, the, uh, th this is a subtlety that gets lost a lot in a stupefied culture, which is to say our culture, <laughs> like almost every culture, arguably there are some indigenous cultures somewhere that are largely hidden from the westernized world that are not predominantly stupefied, but mm -hmm. yeah, at this point we have a global civilization based on stupidity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but the, the core, uh, the, the, everything that is done is done, uh, everything that is done mimetically is done through human bodies. So the core resource that all memes are fighting for is the movement, is control over the movement of human bodies. So um, now there's, there's, a, there's a kind of naive way of understanding that, which I think is still correct. It's just, it sort of misses the, it, it misses part of the point, which is that um, uh, if you literally cannot move in a, like if you literally were incapable of uttering anything about Black Lives Matter, for instance, then you would not be a valuable resource for the Black Lives Matter mimetic structure, right? So, um, and it, the value is in your ability to repeat phrases, which is physically done. But, it's, but I want to emphasize that it's more than physically done. Like the, the, the movement of emotions and the desire to create the impact is something that is stored in a body. Power comes from having a physical body. If you remove the body, the person has no more power. So it, it, it seems kind of inane, but it's actually at the center of the, the confusion. Mm. Uh, this, this is part of why I think the, the, uh, all this stuff on embodiment is coming into the fore as we as we as a species are struggling to become more conscious uh, because a lack of awareness of the physical body makes it more possible to run automated unconscious routines 
through the mind that control the body, mm. which is what I mean when I talk about possession. Most people are not actually controlling what they do or say or even what they think. They're, they're being operated by uh, processes that are running in them they are unaware of, that are mechanically moving themselves around and are making their mouths say things like, but of course I have free will. Mm. You know, <laughs> I'm making the choices all myself. Oh. It just so happens that the beliefs I was raised with were correct. Okay. Wince. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the reason I say that is that the actual fuel is in your physical body, and uh, the, uh, the 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 nature of the fuel was when you're talking about like um, uh, what was it? Uh, hatred, ignorance, and greed. I think were mm -hmm. the three poisons. Okay. So. Uh, those, those, um, those are actually effects of possession, mm. but because it's part of a life cycle, they're also the cause, mm. okay. but you can't orient to them from within the life cycle because the life cycle will sustain itself. And then it uses your own intelligence in order to subvert your attempts to destroy the loop from the inside. Mm. This is part of the experience of something like when you go, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm done with this being a sleepwalker thing. I'm not entirely sure what awakening is, but I'm gonna do it now. I'm gonna sit here and meditate until I do it, whatever it is, or if doing's the wrong frame, whatever. I'm gonna sit here and meditate. And then you sit there and not a, it's one of the worst meditation sessions you have ever had in your life. Mm. Right? And then your mind just keeps babbling about, it. am I doing this right? Oh, shut up, mind. Ah, oh, shoot, there I am. Like, that whole process, part of the reason it occurs that way is because the mimetic infection is running your mind. Mm. And you're not standing outside of the loop of its own life cycle in order to orient to it. It's important to hear when I say this. I, I think that you know this piece, but it's something that slips by our experience so fast because of the stupefied cultural structure. When I say you're not doing this, you're doing that instead, and this is why it's happening. I am describing it the way a mechanic says, oh yeah, the reason your car doesn't run is because uh, this pipe fell off. And so this, this power is not going through. There is zero blame and mm -hmm. zero should. Mm -hmm. It is a description of the structure. The fact is that most people cannot step outside of the looping life cycle they are in because they have not yet cultivated enough of a stability outside of those cycles to be able to choose sort of single-handedly to dismantle them. And it's not a binary thing either. This is a, a, a solidity that cultivates over time. Mm -hmm. And that the more you do it, the more of these cycles you can disrupt, sort of intentionally. Mm -hmm. But the intention is non-narrative. Mm -hmm. It's from the place that, like when, when you are looking from behind your eyes, it's that still place before thought. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the thing about, um, the three poisons, what, what, one of the um, concerns that I have about teachings like that is that it's, um, well, there are two concerns. One is that it's, it seems to underemphasize, and, and I understand that when it's given more detail, they do talk about this, so I, I don't mean to dismiss the teaching here, but um, the way that I usually hear it propagated when I hear people talking about the three poisons or whatever, um, for one thing, it underemphasizes the cyclical life cycle nature of those. Right? Those feed thoughts which feed them. Right? So like when I talk about, I often refer to uh, mind-body loops. Mm. So if you end up with pain in your body, which I, you could li be literally physical pain, but I'm talking about trauma pain, like the, the sense of, I feel so inadequate. Like I could be doing so much more and I'm not, and I, and I feel like I'm a bad person for doing it, for not doing it. The pain itself has no power. What happens is it's almost like steam hitting a steam engine turbine. 
the turbine is set there. It's put there by these mimetic structures, by the stupefying mimetic structures, as is the pain. But like, what happens is that steam hits the engine. The engine churns and starts producing thoughts that act like it's solving the problem, but are actually distracting you from the pain. And in order for that engine to keep revving, it goes down and stimulates the pain again. So you can end up with this loop where I am such a terrible person. I should figure out how to stop being a terrible person. Maybe if I meditated more, I know I'll go read more about morality so that I can see what a fuck up I am and how I should be better. You know, the, that, those kinds of inner turmoils are part of the life cycle. So if you do anything like that, when you orient to something like, God, I'm greedy. Yeah, I'm such a greedy fuck. Mm. Okay, well, right. Then you're actually feeding exactly the thing mm -hmm. that the awareness is trying to address, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So um, that's, what, actually, maybe I'm just saying the same concern twice, but I'll, I'll, say, it, I'll say it differently because there's, there's something, there's a, there's a specific mimetic structure that is part of the westernized world that I've talked about a lot recently. Um, so the second issue is the, um, the sort of Calvinist element of uh, getting, uh, seeking out the suffering as affirmation that you are doing something meaningful. Mm. Okay. So um, I am a bad person. Look at how sinful I am. Look at how much remorse and pain I'm feeling about what a bad person I am for exhibiting these poisons. Here's all this evidence that I'm exhibiting these poisons. And now that I'm emphasizing that pain in myself, now I can feel like I'm doing something about my predicament. I'm not quite sure what my predicament is because being stupefied, I'm not conscious of the fact that this is a 500 year old meme that is injected in me without all of the narrative context in it. It's just part of our culture. But now that I'm trapped inside of this, I can feel like I'm doing something about it because the pain can distract me from this gnawing sense of horror, mm. of nihilism, of meaninglessness, of um, the possibility that when I die, I am going to hell and there's nothing I can do about it. But if I'm not going to hell, I could screw up and go to hell anyway. So I better be really careful and make sure that I suffer a lot and I show a lot of remorse so I don't deviate from this path too much. Um, not, not that Calvinism invented that structure, but that's one of the most common propagation structures, especially in the United States, in North America in general, but especially, especially in the United States. Um, it's one of the main flavors of uh, the way that Vairi will have a kind of um, a sort of syringe on them to inject into the cells. This is sort of a mimetic syringe that gets used over and over and over mm -hmm. again in the stupefying structures, the stupefying mimetic structures. So when I look at, oh, these are the three poisons, um, the fuel is more subtle than just these poisons. If you can see the poisons from the clear still place where you can know Life is, I am, and this is greed. And when I watch greed run in me, I see how it bogs my mind. But because I am stable outside of my mind, I can witness this. And I can, instead of getting sucked in like a television screen, I can see this hurts me and this hurts others by a similar mechanism. And I, in fact, don't want that for me or for others because it is unkind. Mm -hmm. So if that's the place you can come from, then I would say, yes, these are fuels. Mm -hmm. They're not the only fuels, um, but you, if, depending on how you want to define them, you could argue that they, they cover all the fuel options available. Mm -hmm. um, would you... Um... So, something I'm curious about from what you're saying is you say that like they're competing over the motion of human bodies and I wonder why things like words or money or uh, images or things like that wouldn't be what how, how do those fit in are those also being competed for or yes because they're competing for human bodies hmm. so 
the part of the illusion is that those things are real independent of the physical world. Mm -hmm. um, oh, software as well is, as came to mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so in, in practice, it often, you, you'll often witness um, stupefying mimetic structures competing on a higher abstraction level than physical movement. So you, you see this with things like um, uh, the definition of the word privilege. When you look at how various people in the, in the, in the intersectional and, and social, and, um, what's it called, civil rights type cluster, the way that they fight over who does or doesn't have privilege. Okay. Um, this, uh, a, a lot of the arguments are optimizing really hard for how this word gets moved around. But the reason they care about the word privilege and they don't care about the word cut. Right? The reason for the word privilege is because privilege, the quote unquote privilege, the word privilege has become tied to a bunch of have tos. Okay. So uh, if, uh, so I as a, nearly 40 year old white man, North American, am nearly the definition of privilege. Basically all of them can agree on that. There's some question about are, um, are trans women or cis women, like which of them have less privilege mm. and they'll argue back and forth about this, um, but they can both agree that I have more privilege than any of them. Mm. Okay, so it's like, pff, like baseline. So because I have all of this privilege, to the extent that I have been uh, infected with, and by infected with, I don't mean to dismiss the content. Like this, this is an important thing to hear because when people have been infected by these, it can be difficult for them to hear what I'm saying. I am not dismissing the content of the claims being said. Hmm. I am addressing the reasons why the claims are being said and what the results of claiming them are. And whether they're effective propagation memes, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, that that's my personal, I guess, problem with these things is that they, I mean, it's, it's a simple way of saying it would be they propagate, they seem to propagate based on hatred. Yes. Um, I think that's overly I, simplistic, I, but. I, well, I, I think it's a great simplification. I would say that they propagate based on pain mm -hmm. and that hatred is a very particular expression it's mm. a very particular strategy. It's one of the loudest ones. Mm. Um, but uh, um, uh, and so if you're going to if you're going to like summarize the culture wars, culture wars are um, stupefying uh, egregores battling over resources using hatred as their primary weapon. Mm. That's a pretty good summary of the culture wars, mm. and it also highlights why you cannot possibly, possibly resolve the culture wars by figuring out which side is right and fighting for it. It can't be done <laughs> because all you're doing is getting possessed. Mm -hmm. So the reason I went on that tangent is because when I'm saying possessed, I'm trying to describe something factual. I'm describing something structural and I'm not dismissing the content of what's being said. So if I were possessed by these uh, these structures of, um, of uh, the, the, the kind of thinking that usually uses words like privilege, then what would happen is I would feel shame about any place where I might be trampling over others with my excessive privilege, and I would need to be really careful with my speech, and I would need to make myself be a little bit more quiet and avoid speaking up too much and need to make sure that I'm using my voice in order to hand the speaking baton to other people because that's my correct role. This affects literal things about, like, I mean, it'll actually affect my physiology at a very basic biochemical way. I mean, it's not just trivial ways of whether I bend my finger or not is biochemically effective. I mean, it's in terms of like how prone I am to depression. Mm. It affects it on that kind of level. Mm. Um, but it also affects things about the nature of my social dynamics of, um, am I willing to speak up? Am I capable of speaking with confidence? 
if a black woman turns to me and says, check your privilege, right? With this kind of sharp condescending thing, am I capable of turning to her and saying, oh, it seems like there's something here hurting you. Can we sort that out? Can I say that from an open hearted place? To the extent that I am possessed by this, I can't. Hmm. Right? So all of this, even though it looks like you're fighting at an abstraction layer that is about this word privilege, the reason privilege is a word that anything evolves to fight after is because it controls people's bodies. Hmm. Hmm. So what are the basic ways that someone begins to notice this? Well, I, I wish I had more of uh, what I what I learned to call PCK, pedagogical content knowledge mm -hmm. on this. Like watching people go from total ignorance to, oh, I know something about this. Mm -hmm. And then watch a lot of different designs go through that arc. I've seen a few, um, so I can make some extrapolations, but um, I'm, I am sorely ignorant of this. And this is one of the things that a growingly saner, kinder culture needs to ask. Mm -hmm. So I don't claim to have, an, I don't claim to have anything like the answer here, um, but I'll offer some of my own pieces. Um, one, one core place to start is, So I, I need to emphasize that because you're breaking down life cycles, you're breaking down something that is cyclic, like a, a parasite that lives inside of you and that lives across your generations, but, in, but importantly lives inside you and lives inside your own mind-body system. Uh, no matter where you start, you're going to encounter difficulty. Mm. So it's not a linear progression. It's a matter of there's a system of things to get right. I, I think this is what the Buddha was trying to do with his Eightfold Noble Path. He was trying to highlight there is a system of things to get right. And it's not that you do them in a certain order. It's that you need to get all of these right and you get them more and more right. And the more systematically you get these right, the better you have a, a competing engine with which to combat ignorance. Hmm. Okay. So it's, it's the same basic model. I don't model what I see and um, what I train people to do in my own program based on the Eightfold Noble Path, but I think you could if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the pieces of a core engine, from what I can tell, is body awareness. Mm -hmm. Just cultivating stable body awareness. Uh, and I mean something that is very, very uh, grounded and mechanical about this. I, I don't just mean thinking about the body, and I don't mean just occasionally remembering to feel your breath. Mm -hmm. I mean something that is more like, uh, is it surprising to the listener to hear me mentioning your toes? Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, there can be this, oh, wow, I can feel my toes all of a sudden. And it's not like they were numb. They were just outside of awareness. Mm -hmm. So what is required to build, like, what do you build inside? in order to make it so that no matter what part of your body I name, you are not surprised in that way. Whatever the answer is to that question is one of the pieces that seems to me to be essential. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason is this, give, this starts to give a place to stabilize that is clearly outside of the mind. And uh, it can, uh, it's also, it gives you the capacity to be storyless. Not that story is inherently bad, but that uh, if you get lost in story, if you go through things like, um, like recently I had a revelation about um, when I'm feeling hunger in my belly, that I had still been staring at a piece of my mind because what I was feeling was more of this hollow, achy feeling that sort of would reach from my stomach and up towards my solar plexus. and. Um, that when my mind interpreted it as a problem to fix, one solution it came up with is food. And so it would claim that that sensation is hunger. By getting really particular about, no, this, this is the actual sensation I'm experiencing. 
and that comes before the interpretation. But getting really clear about that, uh, I was able to notice in more detail how often I, quote, get hungry, end quote, when I'm feeling emotionally awkward or mm. when I am, um, when I'm feeling inadequate or unproductive. So there I can actually see a loop. I understand the loop now that I know to look for it. Like it's just refining my vision a little bit. Oh, here is the feeling of inadequacy. And then my mind freaks out about needing to look for something and then finds this sensation in my belly and then interprets it as hunger. So now I can distract myself from the feeling of inadequacy by eating. So just noticing these pieces. Uh, uh, so that in some sense, this is a second piece. So that first, this first bit of cultivating stability of awareness of the actual storyless sensations of the body. And from there, dissecting these patterns. But part of this, part of dissecting the patterns in the way I just described it, oh, here's that feeling of inadequacy and here's my mind thinking. And now I found this sensation in my belly and now my mind is thinking this is hunger. And now I'm finding my body moved to try to go get food. In order to break it down at that level of detail, and I can break it down a little farther in terms of exactly what are the mechanisms and the sensations that are going on in the mind? What are the sensations in the body? What precisely is it about the sensations of the body that inspired the effect in the mind? What is the feeling of the connection? In order to bring my vision to bear on those pieces, I have to have a place to stand. So that's the bit with body awareness. And I have to stabilize my attention in a way that is not in thought. So it's not thinking about these structures, it's looking at them, observing what is my actual lived experience right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, uh, a, a piece that, like I, th I think this is core to a lot of what, um, so cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, tries to help with this sort of thing by challenging the narratives, but it's doing so from within a narrative structure because many people are used to uh, living in their minds. Because if you live in your mind and you're disasso disassociated from your body, your body is easier to control with software. Mm. That's just how we're taught to live. Mm. Um, another example along these lines is um, uh, Byron Katie's The Work which is much more explicitly about like noticing and challenging these belief structures. Um, that one moves more in the direction of finding this place of experience that is beyond the mind. Um, and so I think that for, for people who are really wrapped up in their minds, those kinds of practices can be helpful. Uh, and that's honestly, it's most people. Most people are very wrapped in their minds. It takes a lot to notice that there is something outside of mind and, or, or rather, it takes a lot to notice that you're constantly in mind, that you're in the matrix. Mm. Um, but eventually, as far as I can tell, you have to anchor in your physical body. You have to stabilize in physical body um, because otherwise you just generate more mental software within the life cycle of the parasitic mimetic structures. And those end up making you think you're enlightened or insightful or what have you, instead of actually seeing the core truth. Hmm. So um, those are some direct uh, individual practices that I think of as a foundational element of this stuff. There's also, I think it's immensely helpful to learn how to watch memes outside of you. Mm -hmm. um, even th and this, this you can use your mind for. Mm -hmm. Like when I, when I gesture at saying, okay, if you're going to interpret a dog as a living creature, you can totally interpret the United States government as a living creature. Hmm and learning to see these and watching what they do, watching mm. egregores fight, mm. watching when they cooperate, watching when you can see the news is propagating mimetic structures. When you can apply this lens and start to see it, um, you can actually start to predict their rhythms. The more and more detail you get into this, um, but especially there's a very particular thing that I think is really worth learning how to see, which is it's much easier to see in other people than it is in yourself. 
which is the moment of an awakened possession. Mm. It's a, I think of these as sort of like a, they've been infected with herpes and when they get a herpes flare up, mm. it looks like a specific thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people got this herpes flare up when uh, it was revealed that Roe versus Wade was gonna be overturned. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's the, uh, the, the, in order, like the, the, uh, the, the chain involved Roe versus Wade creates alarm in the body. And then the, um, and because they have not learned how to be with the sensations in their bodies, this is, this is a, another point in the foundation, which is like this element of learning how to be with intense sensations and stay in your body in the presence of intense sensations without having to make stories about it. The way that you would hold a child who's going through a temper tantrum or going through a lot of upset, you learn to hold yourself in the course of this enormous movement of energy. Um, a lot of uh, somatic processing and uh, trauma work is this. Hmm. I think that's also an essential foundational piece. But because most people haven't done basically any of that, they have literally the emotional capacity of toddlers, mm -hmm. particularly with respect to certain subjects. And so Roe versus Wade, alarm, it's overwhelming. What do you do? Well, an infant cries to mom. So what that structure gets hijacked for outrage because you're dealing with an adult body. To, uh, and you can use this outrage or this fear in order to insist this isn't okay. We have to do something different. Make this happen. Mm -hmm. But there's still, you, you can even see in the, um, if, if you just watch it from the outside, you can see there's this deep thing of uh, government has to save me. Mm -hmm. Government has to do this because I'm powerless unless government makes these choices. Mm -hmm. Or these other people over here, these, these uh, anti-choicers, as the left would say, mm -hmm. um, these anti-choicers are wrong and we need to not let them have any say in what's going on. Never mind their strategy is symmetric. Mm -hmm. and just as strong and which is why this debate can never be settled with force and therefore adding more force does not help but you can't notice this in the middle the same way a toddler can't notice that yelling and screaming does not actually fix their situation hmm. and so if you now that this is a relatively extreme case where like boom ah, i'm i'm really upset oh god i'm really bothered and you watch like, like people for several days and I'm not, not dismissing relevance of this, I'm just pointing out the structure of it. For several days, people were going around, like after the Roe versus Wade overturning itself, were going through sort of stunned and um, in grief, like, I, I don't, I, this is so unreasonable. And, and they were putting out things on Twitter about how awful this is. And, um, uh, and again, I want to acknowledge like there, there's a symmetric story to tell, which I could imagine being a victory for the people who are pro-life. Uh, the, the sense in which they feel victory is actually another instance of the same thing. They just don't notice it as much of a problem mm -hmm. because it feels like the positive version. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like you, like a heroin addiction doesn't feel like a problem while you're getting your hit, mm. but getting the hit is part of the addiction. Mm. Same thing. Mm. Um, it's just that almost everybody in my babble sphere um, that, that talk about this stuff end up being left-leaning. So I don't hear that many pro-lifers cheering mm -hmm. about this. Um, so the, the thing is that in all of these cases, the body is possessed. And it actually, as you learn how to look for it, you can watch it happen. Um, this is in much more subtle cases. I mean, you, you probably have noticed this with your parents at some point. And when, uh, when a certain argument pops in, like you, there's a certain kind of embodied shift that happens, right? And when I say argument pops in, I mean like, um, like with my father, uh, if you bring up, like dad is really pissed at God for having created ignorance of the nature of death. Hmm. Hmm. He just finds this atrocious and says, like God had better not be real because if he is, hmm. You know, <laughs> so he's like a lot of anger. It, it's eased over the last couple of years, but this has been a defining feature of his emotional landscape for a long time. And um, so because of that, um, up until about the last year, I would say, if they brought up 
anything having to do with death or the afterlife around my father, he would, like he, his body would become more tense. He would look down and almost like he's glaring a hole through whatever is about four feet in front of him mm. right, or through the table in front of him if he's sitting down. And, and then you can say whatever you want. He'll find some phrase or some concept of what you said. And then he'll put out something like, yeah, but the question is, ba 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 And they'll somehow warp it into um, uh, like, like how this is unfair, right? Mm -hmm. And how this is a cruel setup and that uh, we still have to deal with the cruelty of it regardless of how omnibenevolent some God somewhere is. Mm -hmm. So the, the important part I mean, so you can examine the mimetic structure and look at what exactly is the life cycle here. But importantly, the reason I give an analogy to a herpes flare-up is because the, the analogy is really close. Mm. A herpes flare-up is the herpes virus, which has laid dormant and hidden inside of your nerve cells, wakes up, which is to say it goes into its infectious, um, it's sort of its, its reproductive stage. And in its reproductive stage, it's creating all kinds of pain and oozing wounds and so on in order to create infection. Mm. The same thing is happening when someone, <laughs> says, well, like, like are, are you pro-life or anti-life? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, what just happened? <laughs> like, like, oh, so you're going to force women to, um, to have their rapist's children? Mm. I mean, what just happened? Right? It's, it's a gaping wound, oozing hatred, vitriol, in order to propagate the meme. I noticed and when you're can, de demonstrating yeah. this, you are tending to use like a tone of voice, like different tones of voice to show this sort of thing, which seems very plausible. And I wonder how you notice the same sorts of things in text-based medium. Like what, what are the, how would you describe the kinds of signs that you see, say, on a tweet or something like that? It's harder and mm -hmm. I've gotten, I get it more wrong in writing than I do in person mm. or on video. Mm. Um, so you are, there is a drop of, of detail there. Uh, but uh, one, it's a lot easier if you use your body as a listening instrument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the thing is that um, these memes use human intelligence in order to propagate themselves. So that means that you can, one way that you can track what's going on is how are you affected by what you're reading? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, technically, anything that's written is, has a mimetic structure to it. Mm. These are not the only two possible species of memes. Like most jokes don't fall in either of these categories. Mm. Um, they, they, they propagate by a different mechanism. Um, they're easy to tell and they inspire you to tell them, which mm. usually is because they're funny and easy to remember. Mm. Um, so those are the jokes that best propagate. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, the uh, uh, but if if you're working with a stupefying mimetic structure, or if you're encountering a stupefying mimetic structure in text, you're generally going to have some version of cringe mm -hmm. happen in your body because you'll be responding to the attempt to be infected. Now, there, there are a couple of caveats to give to this, uh, three main caveats. Uh, one is that to the extent that you do the stabilizing inner work that I was describing before, it is actually possible to become immune to infection. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is a state that I find myself more and more deeply in. It's not a binary thing, but the, you, you, can, you can increase your immunity to stupefying means such that there's a, there's a certain skill level uh, and, uh, and also certain genres, like it often be topic specific, uh, but uh, there's a certain skill and intensity level of stupefying mimetic infection that just can't get you anymore. Mm. And part of how you know you're there is um, uh, the, the, the delivery mechanism of saying, saying, oh, shut up, white man, you're, you're just um, wiggling, wiggling around your privilege, <laughs> right? You look at that and you, and you have no response. Mm. Like your body just had, like if your body's response is somewhere between neutral and compassion for the pain that you recognize they must be going through because they uttered that, mm. 
if that's the only thing that's going on in your system, you're clean, you're mm. unhookable. Mm. Right? And to me, this is, this is part of the, of the goal of practice is to make it so that more and more of these, um, these stupefying structures actually cannot infect people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's one caveat. Uh, a second uh, caveat is that, um, uh, oh, I, you know, I, had, I, I don't remember the difference between these other two. So maybe I only have two caveats. The other one is um, sometimes the, the hook that you're experiencing is because you have one of these pain structures looping in you and it's hyper vigilant and it is actually looking for opportunities to infect mm. others. Uh, in which case you're more likely to project your own pain onto what you are observing. Okay. Mm. So um, in those cases, sometimes the person will say something innocuous and you'll read something into it. Mm. Right. Um, and it's hard to tell the difference between that and you're actually reading, um, you're, you're correctly perceiving a mimetic structure that someone else is putting forward and it so happens that you're still infectable mm -hmm. and that it requires some boundaries and consciousness and a little bit of meditation and so on to sort yourself out this way. Mm -hmm. the, these two scenarios are hard to sort out in practice and you cannot sort them out while you're activating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have to be able to find that still stable place, which is it's different from being, sorry, I shouldn't say activated. If you're out of range, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you aren't able to stay solidly in the place beyond mind, then you can't sort out the difference between these two, and you'll actually you'll add karma. You'll <laughs> you'll um you'll you'll create more mess in the regardless of which one is true. We'll just create mm -hmm. more mess. But with those caveats, um, if you read some, so one thing you can know is that if you read something and you get activation in your body, you're definitely encountering some mimetic structure, and then there is a that that is trying to infect. And then the question is: Is it coming from you or is it coming at you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the cleaner your perception is, the easier it is for you to track. Um, I'm sorry, sorry, is, that's a little paradoxical. Let me let me clean that up a little bit. Um, when you sort out your side and you make yourself unhookable, you will have to do so in part by learning how you were hookable in the first place, mm. and that makes it easier to see how these structures move in culture. So a common, like, well, there's a place where I still get hooked and I still have a lot of heat. I seem to have stability to deal with it most of the time, but sometimes it tips me over, which is uh, this, this stuff around uh, um, the future is feminine or the future mm -hmm. is female, they say. The future is female and uh, how and, uh, empowering women and it's women's turn and all of that stuff. Um, when that get when I get any hint of that moving over into male disempowerment, it triggers the fuck out of me. Mm. Okay. Now I have to be with that and sort it out and sort of clean it out in myself because I can't clearly see through my own distortion where I'm picking up on distortions in what others are saying versus where I'm anticipating a distortion and adding my own. Mm in order to almost create its, uh, its mating partner. Hmm. Um, but in other cases where I've cleaned this up in myself, I've been able to see in a lot of detail, like I, I, I don't care about being called privileged. It's, it's annoying to be told I'm not allowed to speak because I'm a white guy, but I can, but there's a, there's a quality of, okay, that's, that's your thing. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I can see what's going on here and yeah, it, it, it's very simple. Because of that, I can see the nature of the mimetic attack in a lot of detail, because I'm seeing it with clear eyes. Um, the, uh, the other case that seems worth mentioning is if you are already unhookable and something comes in to try to get you. Because you're unhookable, it's, it's like there's, there's, there's nothing for it to hook on. It just slides right over your skin and it doesn't affect you. Um, but if you see how others are affected, and if you tune, sorry, I guess the thing that I should say here is that you can still feel what it's trying to do. 
you can still tell what it's trying to do. Um, like if, if someone says, are you coming to our party or are you going to be a pussy? Hmm. It's like, if, if you don't care about being considered a pussy, it's like, like I mean, some people get triggered over why are you equiv equivocating pussy with something weak and, and getting into all the feminist stuff there. But like, that's a different hook. If, if you don't care, if you're unhookable in the space, you can still look at it and go, why do you care so much? What's mm. the pain here? Mm. Right, because you can still tell, even if you're unhookable. Someone calls you, you're a fucking zebra. Okay. Okay, I'm a fucking <laughs> zebra. What's going on for you? And, and until... <laughs> Uh -huh. Right. So that's a uh, that's an example I borrowed from Harry Chase. By the way, I just thought it was a beautifully clear one. Uh, that's good. Yeah. So you can still feel something of it's trying to do something. It's trying to control me or or do uh -huh. something. And then you can explore with curiosity the point at which you you see why as clearly as you see that I have a nose. You just see why it's going on, not as a theory in your mind, but you're looking at them mm -hmm. and you can see it in detail. The process of getting there is increasing mimetic literacy. Mm -hmm. so you see, oh, so zebra to you means this, and you're seeing me this way. Oh, and you don't like that I did X, Y, Z, and now you're trying to make me do otherwise because you hurt, and this is how you know to express it because when you were three, your mom did this, and this is the pain that you have, and now you're trying to replicate that with me in the role of mom. Mm. Okay, mm. okay, that makes sense to me. Mm. Right. The perception is made of compassion at that point. I'm wondering about two situations, one where two people are talking and someone gets triggered, um, but they're not talking about anything like, I don't know, like some, some big topic or something. It's just like an ordinary conversation, say in a relationship or something like that, when people are getting triggered about uh, something that's more local to them and their relationship or something like that. And then similarly, what happens when two people are very confused by like, cannot understand what the other person is saying. I wonder if the, either of those situations or something you could say something about. Uh, I could say things about them. I'm, uh, I'm a little lost as to, to where to start. Can you clarify what you're asking about them? Mm -hmm. Like why Part do they of what I'm mind? noticing is that a lot of the examples that you're talking about, I can, they're very helpful, very clarifying. And um, I'm reminded of like, I think I stopped reading the news at some point. I don't know when, like I, I, I was just like, this is, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I was like, it, and basically I know other people have talked about this as well, but like, if something is meaningfully significant, you will hear about it, even if you're not uh, trying to go look for it. Like, it'll come to you. Like, you know, something momentous happened with uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned. Here we are on this podcast talking about that. That's like, you know, big enough of that's like good to be, know about that you'll hear about it. And that works for me. And um, and then also I don't I don't see myself getting activated by that kind of thing in the way that you're describing. What I do see myself getting activated by is like local personal things, like talking to people where like I'll somehow in a way that's not obvious to me, find myself in an argument with someone or uh, uh, getting, I'll, I don't know, a lot of the times I'll like have interactions where I'm like sad about something that happened for like a day or two days or weeks or months where I'm like, wow, when I think about this person, it's like, I remember this interaction that we had that just didn't feel very good. And um, I know I'm participating in that. I'm not, not trying to blame the other person, but like, I don't know, I, it's harder for me to see what's happening there in a way where it's like, I don't know, there's some way that I've like cultivated immunity to what you're talking about with like politics, for example, or like, mm -hmm. uh, like broad level civilizational ideologies or something like that. Like not perfect, not perfect, I'm sure. But like, it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't buy into that stuff so much. But when it comes down to like, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, hell for, for example, without going into too much detail, I mean, I, you got to see this firsthand when we were in person the other, you yeah. know, a couple months ago, I, I like got, you know, exploded in a way that's not really, I don't know, I'm still thinking about that. Like what happened there? I don't know that <laughs> that hurt, that didn't feel good. And like, how much of that is me and how much is that is someone else? And like, what exactly happened there is not 
obvious, you know, um, and yeah. uh, no, no hard feelings okay. to the third person that is there that no blame or resentment, but it's just like, and what? I know they know. <laughs> yeah, but like, I don't, I'm still confused. Like what, what, I don't, what's happening there, you know? Right. So if you remember the example of the, uh, the life cycle of um, transgenerational trauma from alcoholism. Mm-hmm. So you could ask what caused, what would cause the parent to go, Shh, don't ask stupid questions. Right? So that's going to be a kind of something is triggered in them. And it's not because of some belief structure. It's not because of some narrative. Um, I mean, there is maybe some narrative attached to it, but it's more like God, whack. I mean, that's, a, that's also an exaggeration, but like the, the reaction is, oh God, oh God, I can't, I have to get away from this. How do I get away from it? Right, this thing. Wow. So the, uh, I, I, I think, uh, like all of these have this, this same underlying structure type, but I feel like that's, that's an example that is closer to the type of thing that you're pointing at here um, mm -hmm. explicitly. Because like, even though, even though it's not necessarily with physical violence, but where you, when you have something like, why did you move your cup that way? That mm -hmm. implies X, Y, Z, and how dare you? It's like, I mean, hmm. like, what's creating that? I, I want to make a very particular request of you, uh, yeah. which is uh, a very, very specific request. And I hope sure. you'll understand what I'm requesting and adhere to it. Uh, I would love it if you would recall the thing that happened a couple of months ago when we were interacting in person and describe sort of like clinically what you saw happening without referencing either the person that was there or the topic matter that was being discussed. Okay. Do you think that's something try. you're capable of doing? I think so. Okay. I think so. <clears throat> I will, I will do my best. Okay. I, it's doable. It's just, uh, I have to, <laughs> may have to edit the video to, if I slip up. <laughs> yes, I'm happy to do that if need be. Um, okay, so so first, it seems it seems important to to give enough of the of the the context of it. Um, and I'll, I'll adhere to your request to the best of my ability here, while while still describing the context. Mm -hmm. So, in that context, uh, uh, there, uh, you had a personal difficulty that you were working with that this other person knew about, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And um, then I'm trying, I'm trying to remember the, the details. Uh, I, believe, I believe it was specifically that uh, I think you revealed that you were having this difficulty Mm -hmm. But it was it was an interpersonal difficulty you were having with someone, and you were keeping that someone anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, this fourth person, you're keeping the fourth yeah. person anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, we're and not replicating third... this trauma here. <laughs> Although, if we do, I just won't include it in the recording. <laughs> yeah, no. So yeah, far, um, so good. You're doing great. Great. Uh, and the the third person who was actually in our three-person conversation, at one point mentioned the name of the fourth person. That's right. And um, this, this created for you a lot of um, tension, alarm, uh, angst. Uh, I don't know exactly what the emotional arc was, but I, uh, my impression was that you felt a kind of betrayed and that, um, like you, you had a war going on inside of you between two parts. Um, the, the part of you that uh, focuses on compassion and connection, that was recognizing the value that you have in this relationship with this third person mm -hmm. right? and wanting that to be a smooth connection and to smooth out things as they arise and recognizing that sometimes things will arise and it's something that you want to sort out. And this other part that who is busy, how dare you have done that mm -hmm, aim mm -hmm, at them? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I'm guessing by your by your by your <laughs> by your hell to smile that this this feels pretty nailed. Yeah. So far. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Uh I think I'm in, in, in to be accurate, I think I'm blushing because it feels like <laughs> it's I'm like, God damn it. Yeah, no, this is what precisely what I asked for. Yes. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. So I can I can say um, I can say a piece about it in terms of the context of in which you brought this up and said, can yes. you diagnose this? Can, can you split this apart clinically? Yeah, specifically because I think this sort of thing generally not that not necessarily the particular mechanisms of that but like this inter, basically interpersonal situations tend to cause the kinds of things you're talking about for me far more frequently than a right. lot of the examples you're talking about right so i can i can break this down in a lot of detail this this is actually a kind of practice that we do in my container in mage mm -hmm. a fair bit we bring in the interpersonal interactions often from the lived experience of the people in the container and we'll, we'll break it down in terms of here is precisely the mimetic structure that is going on, and here is your role, and here is their role, and here is the nature of confusion. Mm -hmm. The point being to tune the mind to become more lucid to mimetic structures overall. Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, missing almost all of the context, both of, of the nature of, the, like the exact nature of the connection between you and the fourth person, uh, most of the history of you and the third person uh, and your entire life past of trauma. Uh -huh. like I'm, I'm missing all that context. Yeah. <laughs> so with that huge caveat, yeah. um, it's, it's obvious to me that the part that woke up and was how dare you ing at the third person mm -hmm. was trying to enact a kind of punishment threat on them mm. in order to control them. Mm. Mm. That basic structure, I can't be okay unless you do X. Mm. Right? That is one of the basic internal structures that get experienced under stupefying mimetic possession. Mm. Mm. So the, the, now the reason for that is because stupefying means, stupefying uh, hypercreatures utilize a quirk of human development, which is that there are probably exceptions somewhere, but I haven't, I'm not aware of any. Um, basically all of them utilize the fact that children are in fact dependent on their parents, particularly when the children are first born. Mm. Like their baseline of actual literal physical survival depends on their ability to attune to their parents, their ability, or their caregivers more generally, uh, their ability to get the, their attention. And the options that the kids have are very limited. The kids don't think, oh, if I cry, I'm going to get mom's attention. It's more like they feel upset and the upset is so much that all they can do to try to deal with the amount of energy that they're experiencing in their little bodies is to cry and scream. And as a nice fact of biology, this affects most moms mm. <laughs> <laughs> and this creates attention. But you can imagine things like the, um, uh, let, me, let me not go too far down that road. There are lots of things I could say about child development, um, but the, the core fact is that a child's ability to survive, even as they get older and they're able to move their bodies more consistently as they want. Like if you watch a newborn, they basically cannot reliably touch specific spots of their bodies. They often are dumbfounded by the existence of their feet. There's, there's like a lot of really basic stuff about having a body that uh, a newborn is totally unfamiliar with and they have to learn how to use their bodies at all. Um, so uh, even at the point where the kid has figured out how to start moving their bodies, maybe even is starting to crawl, they still cannot get food except through the caregiver. If they are attacked, they are not able to defend themselves. So their ability to summon protection comes from the caregiver. So there's still this externalization of your basic survival needs that is built into the experience of being a child. Stupefying mimetic structures use that externalization of safety in order to externalize your knowing. Mm. Mm. Okay. So if they, can, uh, if they can basically stun you, if they can keep you emotionally locked, even if it's some part of you, just some part of you emotionally locked in the experience of being a dependent child, and then they can evoke that experience of being dependent in that way so that it is tied to specific behaviors. 
then they can program you because they need, you need something external to you so you believe in that state. You need something external to you to be or behave a certain way for you to be okay. So a huge hint that you are currently experiencing the herpes flare-up of a stupefying force is your insistence that you need something outside of you to change in order for you to be okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that insistence is not mental. It's much more of an emotional thing, particularly if you hold a conscious belief of, oh, I, it's not good to manipulate people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you have that kind of idea in your head, then you will hide the process uh -huh. from yourself yeah. while you do it. Uh -huh. Then you're a sideways fuckhead. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 this is tracking with um, a lot of stuff and it, um, yeah, give me a second here. So first off, this feels, this feels like very vulnerable and I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah, we, I'm, I'm okay to go here because this seems good. And I also, I feel some remorse about the third person in particular of like, I don't, I don't know how to deal with that kind of situation. I don't know. Yeah. In that particular situation, but also in general, it's like in other situations and then how to put it. Yeah, I, I'm also reminded of something that has become clear recently to me, which is that it seems to me that one of the really bottlenecks on my ability to flourish right now is my capacity to process something emotionally without needing other people, which is what you're talking about. Like, uh, Yes. Yeah, I think often I do want something from other people, like an apology or, uh, you know, uh, talking about something or uh, saying, oh, I will do this or I won't do that or something. And I've done a lot of different like emotional processing techniques, including meta, but other ones as well. And it feels like there's a specific feeling of like, oh, I can take care of myself through these things, but it's not as good as if someone else I can interact with someone else and they can interact in a way that feels good, you know, <laughs> which depends on the situation very much. But like, for example, an apology or um, a hug or, you know, saying something kind and reassuring or whatever it is that tends to be like, okay, we're good. Like, uh, and, and, and it's very, <laughs> yeah, it's very painful. To I relate. Me. I'm relating a lot. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's why I'm being vulnerable because like, this feels like, not uniquely my problem. There, there are certainly yeah. other people that experience this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, but I, I do have things I can, I can name in this space. Cause I feel like, so this was a huge problem for me just a couple of years ago. And mm -hmm. I feel like I've worked through almost all of it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I might say almost all of it. I mean, there's, there's, there's an element of something like the last 1% takes the other half of your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair. So what do you Fair. mean by almost all? Yeah. Uh, but the um there's so there's a there's a subtlety here in so when you say something like okay i can handle this on my own but it's a lot easier with somebody else or more that complete can just be more true. complete it feels like partial when i do it by myself right that part matters a lot more mm -hmm. right because if if it's if you're able to hold yourself and it's something like it's just a preference, then you could imagine having a conversation with somebody along the lines of, hey, I'm holding this charge in myself. I'm having a lot of difficulty with it. Uh, and it makes it difficult for me to be open with you. Mm -hmm. um, I would find it a lot easier if we could have a conversation about this. And particularly if it feels fitting to you to get an apology from you, I mean, is that something that you're open to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can you feel how that has a clean quality to it where I'm holding the thing, but I'm speaking to you not from the thing? Yes. Right. So the, the problem is when you cannot speak from that clear place, because mm -hmm. it means that you can't relate from clarity. Mm. And the reason almost always is because 
you have not yet cultivated the capacity and willingness, which are sort of the same thing, to be with the intensity of the sensation in yourself by yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's nothing wrong with seeking support and pref even preferring it. You can say, yeah, you know, I can handle this. I can, like, that person can uh, refuse to apologize or never utter an apology and it can drive me nuts, but I can be with the drive me nuts. Mm -hmm. I can be with the anxiety and the stress and it's really, really hard, but I can do it. And I'm going to keep doing it because I'm here for me unconditionally. Mm -hmm. And if you can come from that place and then uh, create enough space that you can go up to the person and go, but you know, it would be a lot easier if we could have this chat or you open to it. I can't even promise to be clean. Is yeah. that okay? Right? <laughs> if you can do that, then it's, it's smooth and great. So the core issue is actually not having built the capacity slash willingness. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of it. And again, I, it's important not to hear the Calvinist thing that we often add to things like that. Mm, it's a like fact. I'm bad. describing a fact. Uh -huh. Yes, it's not you, you, like you fuckhead, you haven't yes. bothered to create this capacity because you're lazy. Like, uh -huh. no, it, it's a description of a fact. Like, the fact is that you haven't built this capacity in yourself yet. And so, what you're doing is, in a childlike way, seeking others to do your emotional processing. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where it can get slippery. I know that for me, for, for dealing with my version of this, um, I have had to be really careful about, um, like I, I, would, I would go through things like, look, I, I can be with it, but it's so much easier with this other person. And um, so let me just go talk to them. It's important to remember that what you are sorting out are life cycles of parasites that are living inside you and choose what you think. Mm. So if you struggle to be clear in your communication, and by clear, I'm meaning the specific, like coming solidly from meta, not even shakily from meta. I mean, coming from the heart, from a sense of seeing their humanity, from your humanity. If you struggle with same-sidedness, if you're worried about how they're going to respond, if there's any hint of difficulty in there, the chances are very good you're interacting with them instead of building your capacity. Mm -hmm. And that the reason you're doing that is because this is the current capability of that mimetic structure living inside of you to keep you distracted from doing the thing that will actually weed it out. Mm -hmm. This can put you in a position that sucks a lot because it can mean you have to move through intense overwhelm in a way that feels very alone. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately, there's no rule written in the cosmos about you have to do this 100%. Like you can just try to be with yourself and then go, yep, I've hit my limit. This might not be clean. Hey, so-and-so, I need an apology from you. Okay. And then afterwards you sort it out and you kind of, you feel a little better. Now you have more space because the parasite fed, right? But now that you've, you've had a little bit of space and you can breathe more and you have more capacity and then you can reflect on what exactly just happened. Where did you lose yourself? Can you notice it in more detail as judgment free as possible, just to understand where were your choices? And where you didn't have choice, but you need choice, how do you cultivate the strength of the capacity to choose? Hmm. Very clean, very simple. You give yourself permission to mess up as much as you need to, but you don't let the messing up narrative become a reason to avoid doing the work. Hmm. If you can be clear about that, then you can be on a trajectory where this unhooks systematically. I'm wondering what specific recommendations you might make for me. I think like it's obvious to me that I could cultivate more body awareness and more presence and uh, things like that, but that also feels insufficient. And I could be wrong. It could be as simple as that, but I'm, it, it feels like there's, 
my experience of this sort of thing is that there's some other fundamental skill that's missing. And like, of course, the, the other things could be cultivated in more degree, but like uh, body awareness doesn't seem to be sufficient or things like that because I'm, I get it's hooked not. in these kinds of things. It's not sufficient. And you can, you can end up living in a simulation if you just stop at body awareness. Body awareness is a fantastic gate for starting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the place that you actually want to find is deep in your consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just easier to get there through body awareness than it is through trying to concentrate on your thoughts and seeing the thoughts pass by. Mm -hmm. Because you can get lost in thoughts and thinking about thoughts. If it's, that's within the realm that these uh, mimetic parasites are very, uh, that's fighting mimetic parasites in their territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just not a great place to be. Mm -hmm. um, for you in particular, uh, I don't know. I can give some guesses. Uh, I would want to uh, watch and feel you for longer before I would be able to really zoom in and go, okay, I see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And this is my invitation. This is where I think you should look. If you look here, I think what you see for yourself will free you. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not at that stage with you. Mm -hmm. um, but my guess, my, my main guess for you is I want to say something like you, you, you often come across to me as having a thread of shame or embarrassment or inadequacy or something like that around the fact that you exist. Hmm. and that um like I'm, I'm guessing that you have an easier time with uh with meta for others than you do for yourself oh absolutely yes yeah, yeah. Um, i don't i don't have um like uh sometimes there's like you'll, you'll hear people reports of like, oh, it's just, it's just like excruciating to send love to themselves or something. It's not like that. It's just, it's just much stronger and easier for other people than it is for myself. Yeah. So my main, my main inclination, my main gesture for you would actually be to stable on self meta. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a, there's a trick that, um, that designs that often feel like yours feels like to me. Mm. Okay. So I want to emphasize, I don't know your design very well on the inside. I haven't seen your mimetic structure in enough detail to, mm -hmm. to really say. But um, when I've w watched people who feel a lot like you feel, uh, the reason that they have an easier time with things like meta to others is because they're getting some sense of alleviation for their pain, mm -hmm. which is it's different from actually addressing it. Mm. They're getting some sense of alleviation from their pain by the reflection of how good a person they are being mm. through their compassion and care that is externally directed. Mm. This is related to, um, are you familiar with the Enneagram by any chance? Not, not, not so much. I think we, I think we had this conversation last time. Okay. Yeah. Let me just set that aside then. Ignore the Enneagram. Um, but, uh, the, um, uh, the, the type of person who, uh, who, works in soup kitchens all the time and is constantly giving and is like like hosting people and is like oh it's so beautiful to see you and it's like th th this very outward directed kindness and support uh that can be coming from a place of of like if you ask them well of course i'm a good person mm. right but the reason th they say i'm a good person because look at these things i'm doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there's any hint of that, of uh, my value, you can see in what I am doing in my care for others. Mm. Right? This actually means that the care itself is impure. Mm. Mm. Right? So what this often traces back to is th th there's, this, there's this place that a lot of people slip around, which is that they'll, they'll, they'll taste the truth of metta when they're directed to things that are easy to love. But the reason that they're easy to love and they're external, one of the reasons is that it fits their narrative. Mm -hmm. It goes, it, it slides along and is parallel to the streams of the mimetic parasites that are living inside of them. Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes that means that they will confuse metta with other things. Mm -hmm. right? But they can actually catch a glimpse of the true thing and when they direct that, and this is part of where the agony can come from, hmm. when they direct that true thing to themselves, 
the agony is a correct perception of the pain that they have been feeling and have been ignoring through their distraction strategies. Mm. The reason they're experiencing it is because that's what needs holding. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if it, like, I'm not anywhere near as much an expert in meta as you are. I'm, mm. I'm looking at this from a, um, uh, from a memetics perspective and from having gone through a couple of, um, of, uh, I don't know, like spiritual shock points, mm. uh, but uh, um, but I haven't really like I, I I do meta, but I haven't dived into it really hard or studied it or trained with teachers a lot. Or I feel the same way, my friend, despite focusing on it quite a bit. So anyway, okay, cool. Well, my opinion, my perspective, my impression is that uh, you can't do meta. There's a, with a star asterisk, there's like, I'm, I'm saying this stronger than is literally true. Like meta is a truth. It is a frequency of truth in the existence of reality. Of course, anybody can do meta and it's under any conditions, it's always available. That's part of its nature. But for practical purposes, you cannot send meta to others if it is not emanating from the meta you are sending yourself. Mm. Mm. It makes me curious how you would. So of course I'm interested in this on a personal level on the levels that we've been talking about, but I'm also in the back of my head thinking about, you know, I spend time sharing Meta and I wonder what you would do to structure the way Meta is taught or distributed. Um, I don't, I, I, due to unfamiliarity, I don't know what I would change, mm -hmm. um, but I, I basically teach Meta in my space. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, um, I mostly don't emphasize sending it to others at all. Mm. I, I highlight, uh, like sometimes you can sort of sniff it out by noticing there is something true about the adoration of a pet or the love of, that you have for a child, where no matter how messy the mimetic parasites are in your system, truth is true. And so you can feel and sort of get the frequency. Um, but the, the main thing I direct this towards is get the scent and then point it at yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Notice where it's difficult and address that difficulty. Mm -hmm. okay. The same way you address the difficulties we were naming before of, okay, you're in this interpersonal conflict and suddenly you're, you're like, ah, overwhelmed with like, must get apology, how dare you, <laughs> brarg. Uh, okay, no, let me just push that. Like, when, when, when that arises and you can tell, okay, I'm struggling for control here. Um, there's a kind of work that's involved in learning to feel that much intensity, including that much struggle and still not, um, you can learn to make it impossible for that level of intensity to even be able to reach the steering wheel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you are so stable in your center and you are so present for the energy you, you're willing to feel it all sort of like with if you're with a um when a toddler is having a meltdown um you you don't help by going oh what do you need what do you need uh, do you do you want your beanie do you want this do you want and, like that's that's anti-helping <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but if you can be present so, so is stonewalling but if you can be present with the kid with this sense of Oh, you're really upset. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm such a meanie. Yeah, I won't let you have this thing and that's so mean and awful of me and I'm a monster. Yeah, that's right, I'm still not gonna give it to you. Yeah, and that makes me an awful person, right? Just utterly clean and present. If you can do that, you, you build your capacity to do that with these in part by letting yourself experience them and coming back to center, mm -hmm. experience and coming back to center. So it's the same thing for meta directed at yourself that will kick up these mimetic parasites that block your heart. Mm. And you have to work those out before you go around loving, quote unquote, loving other people. Because if you don't, then that love is often going to get braided with the codependent stuff of, see how benevolently compassionate I am, won't you take care of me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a slip in this stuff that is impure. Mm. So in order to clean that up, you've got to start with yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's what I encourage people to focus on. 
is get the scent any way you can, but then prioritize you and do the cleaning up work. If you're going to focus on others, you, fo you get very clear inside why. Are you doing it because you're following a metta meditation? Are you doing it because that makes you a better person? Mm. Or are you doing it because sending metta is kind to yourself? Mm. If you can come entirely from that last one, then it is a self-reinforcing process that purifies you even more deeply. And what you're sending is pure. What's it like for you when you send metta to yourself, when you do self-love practice? Can you ask the question differently? <laughs> I'm sort of aware of what it's like for me and imagining that it might be different for you. I think for me, there's probably two ways that I practice it. There might be more that I'm not thinking of right now, but one is simply to, well, yeah, there's a few ways. So, so one way is simply feel metta in my heart, bring up that feeling and then say simple phrases like I love you or love myself towards myself. A second way is to, um, I, I, I find this works quite nicely is to like use custom meta phrases, but specifically like compliments, like basically I'll compliment myself. And that's, that works great. It's like, that's good stuff. And then uh, that, and that feels a bit more conditional or something like that, but also like really feels nourishing emotionally for me. And then um, a third way is sort of um, noticing disparities between the intention to love myself and the way that I act and trying to sew up the disparity. So for example, um, Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, sometimes I have trouble eating enough food, for example. Um, and so like, and that's something I, I'm actively working on, like making sure that I eat enough food. It's like, well, the loving thing is to feed myself and eat enough food and eat. It's like, am I doing that or not? And and then I eat food and that's the loving thing to do for myself. And that that's a simple example, but you know, it could be anything else. Do I get enough sleep or um, do I set a boundary with someone or, mm. you know, behave in any number of situations in a way that is kind to myself is there some disparity between so i wonder i am i'm imagining i could be wrong i could just be projecting this but i'm imagining that there's something that you do when you practice metta for yourself that might be different than that or um more deeply nourishing or something like that and it, it sounds largely similar i do mm -hmm. the third thing as well i never thought of it as metta practice um I tweak it a little bit because I don't put any pressure on myself to make myself behave differently. Mm -hmm. Instead, I try to bring the feeling of metta to the entire situation, mm -hmm. including the recognition that there is a reason why I act in a way that doesn't seem kind to myself. And um, I guess this shifts more in the direction of Karuna, but there's, there's a, um, <clears throat> I think mean, like let's bring all of Brahma Viharas for the win. But the but uh, I'm I'm trying to include like what one sign that I've done the, the whole perception holding thing well is that there is no need for effort to create change. Mm. The change just happens because it is obvious that that is the change that belongs. Mm. There's nothing resisting it. So what this tells me is that there is some pain in my system that I haven't really held and honored and seen and been with. So when I'm feeling that discrepancy, rather than trying to make myself change my behavior because I have an image of what I should be doing mm -hmm. and I try to force myself to behave differently, instead I notice this is tr when I can, I slip up. Sometimes I do force myself, but when I can, I notice there's a reason for this gap. And this reason is a call for kindness. Mm -hmm. Where does kindness, where is kindness needed? Where is it being asked for? Can I see what is true here? So coming in with that tone to the extent I can. Um, so yeah, I guess that is a meta practice. I just never thought of it consciously that way. It was just the thing to do. Um, but when I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, let's rev the meta battery. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mostly do the first thing you described. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I sort of flip the order. Like I, uh, I'll use a couple of phrases. Uh, they're usually very specific meta phrases. Um, uh, but sometimes I'll instead I'll switch to uh, imagining. Except sometimes I'll, I'll pick up on something external. Like if I'm if I'm having difficulty getting the 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 feeling of the sun radiating in the heart. Um, if I just for some reason can't find it, then sometimes I'll remember uh, one of my little kitties. Mm -hmm. I'll remember snuggling them, mm -hmm. or I'll remember somebody that I love a lot, like one of my parents or uh, one of my ex girlfriends. I'll, I'll I'll remember this feeling of love and the warmth that's associated with that. And then once I feel that warmth, I drop the thing that I'm using to find it, and I focus on the sensation. I usually emphasize breathing it and enjoying it. But the focus, um, I guess the main difference I would say is that I'm really, from what I've heard you describe, is that I'm really emphasizing the self-reference. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not like there is this meta thing that I am trying to do. And if I do the meta thing, then I have more meta. Mm. Instead, it's more like, um, I guess I never thought of it quite this way before. So like I'm, I'm inventing the, the, the analogy here, given the context of this conversation. This is a symbiotic egregore, right? So what it means for it to more deeply integrate is that I become it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to send kindness to myself if I am becoming kindness? Now, this is, this is not how I analyze it, but the, there is an experience that this maps towards, which is something like um, noticing the way in which I am enjoying the feeling of metta. And that metta is enjoying itself, making it so that those two are not different. So I'm feeling this delight in, like the warmth in my heart is just pleasant. And I'll first put some focus on um, like the way that it feels nice to stand out in the sun and to feel the warmth on my skin. I'm enjoying the warmth in my heart and feeling that radiate throughout my body. And I'm bringing my awareness more and more to the exquisiteness of the experience. And that has a self-reference loop in that the fact that I am bringing my awareness to the exquisiteness is because it is exquisite to do so. I'm not forcing my attention to do this, or to the extent that I am, it's because there's something that needs melting, in which case that process I described before comes to bear. But it's it's that I really savor and enjoy the experience of metta itself and allow that to amplify and radiate because it's yummy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes I will do something that is kind of like compliments, but it's more like um, recognizing to the extent that I am metta uh, in the symbiotic way, I still act through this human, and this human is awfully finite. Hmm. That's not just stupefying mimetic structures. This is like a, an animal. Like this animal has drives and desires and things like that. Now, there's de these are desires the same way like a cat or a dog has desires. Um, most of the desires that, when I, when, it's, when I have things like, I desire for mimetic literacy to spread through the world, that's not this animal. Hmm. Right. That's far too advanced for this animal. That's made of mimetics. Hmm. So the sub-mimetic being that I am using to speak through, this one has needs and desires. It wants to be held. It feels like something for it to feel joy. This is Michael. Bringing that quality of I love you, Michael. I forget if you happen to know this, but Michael is my given name. So it hits extra strong that you're saying it that way. Uh, well, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I want to ask as well, um, you've already talked about this, but I, I, just to ask the same question again from a slightly different angle, can you say once more how one finds and heals the aspects that one is not willing to love about oneself? Or able to? Uh, I didn't hear you ask this question before, um, mm -hmm. but I... Uh, yeah, the last I question was trying to get at this, but didn't direct your attention towards it. Uh, <laughs> slip, slip, slip. Yes. Um, <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm, I'm definitely not... I haven't mastered this, but I can let you know what I do. And I, mm -hmm. I have successfully moved through this several mm -hmm. times now. Um, one thing that I find very helpful is um, cultivating through practice permission for me to be the way that I am, including, um, there's a way where I used to hear, I was about to say a phrase that has driven me nuts for years, and now I find myself trying to say it. I was like, oh, damn it, let me, let me see if I can reword this. The phrase I was going to say is, uh, bring acceptance to yourself, including the parts of you that you don't accept. Mm -hmm. which is like, okay, just hit the magic accept yes. button. Right? Yes. I mean, but, but, that, but that isn't quite what I mean. What I mean is something like, okay, so, so my default way of being, I think it's given me a lot of, um, a lot of uh, mileage, uh, but, has also, uh, but is also creating a lot of pain in my system is a streak of, I guess I could call it perfectionism. It's, um, I could also differently call it uh, uh, an insistence on integrity. And there's a reason for it, which is that if there, 99% um, of the way still has you dead, like there's, a, there's something about um, uh, mathematical levels of perfection that if you're, if you're just a little bit off, that means that you've misunderstood the entire thing. There's a lot of a lot like that in spirituality. And I find that holding to that kind of standard lets me run a lot cleaner and it purifies my system in a very, very effective way. But it also means that I bring this fucking taskmaster down onto me about, oh, right there, your mind flitted for a moment to couldn't they just hold me? I don't want to hold this. Fuck that part. I'm an adult, <laughs> screams this, screams some not really adult part of my system. Now, if I'm still fused with that, and I, I've, I've gotten a lot of space from that even in just the last couple of months. So it's like, this is an ongoing evolution. But what I've found is that in some corners where I bring to bear this, I cannot tolerate this aspect of me. Like there's, there's a... Um, there's a part of me, for instance, uh, actually, this, this, this one's actually fairly alive. It's actually kind of vulnerable for me to share this bit. Um, there's, there's a part of me that still is very alive that really wants a partner, a woman, who will, um, in, in some important sense, basically just take care of me. Okay. Where... Um, uh, I just like, want to feel this like feminine enfolding. And it, in the back of my mind, a part of me is tracking, you mean I want a mom for a partner? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I like, but like there's, there's, uh, there's some element of, um, like I can feel part of what's going on there is a combination of, uh, there was a way where I got a lot of that as a kid, but, but there were places where it was unreliable and I want to feel the reliable version. And by the same token, this part of me wants to recreate the frustration of having almost but not quite what I want. Wow. Because that's familiar. Like mm -hmm. I've been able to like see this structure and I can see how it's created a lot of my relationships in the past. And so there's this, there's this element, this particularly shows up for things like when I imagine the nature of my sexual relationship with some woman, I sort of there's a, there's a part of me that wants to be able to not put in any effort and still have it be really good. Mm. Mm. And you can, I, I, there it, it, I, I slipped and you can hear in the tone, there's this element of self-mocking that comes in. I just don't want to put in any effort and just have mm. it land. 
But the fact is, there's a part of me that does want this. So being able to hold all of that, being able to come in with some element of, first off, this is true about me. It doesn't mean it's eternally true, and it doesn't mean this is how I'm going to define any future relationship, but it does mean this lives inside of me. It's also true that I find it fucking annoying. Mm. And a part of me would like to kill that. Mm. It is actually unkind to the part that is angry and suppressing to ignore it as well. Mm -hmm. right? So to the extent that I can, this is, I guess in some sense I'm describing step two. <laughs> like I, I, can, I can go back to step one in a minute because um, I don't think I actually named it. But in this step two, um, if I can notice I am upset with this thing and I'm trying not to be, that that is actually unkind. If I can bring kindness to, yeah, it's really fucking annoying to have what amounts to a toddler trying to run the sexual side of my romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. right? This has created problems for me in these specific ways. I'm pretty sick of it. Right? So there's that anger element. And separately from that, I can feel into it. And it feels a little sickening to feel into it after acknowledging, I guess in, in internal family systems, you'd say this is something like a protector, only it's almost the opposite. It's like, mm. <laughs> it's the attacker. Mm. Um, <laughs> But I have to still have to address the hot thing first and then feeling into this element of, yeah, but I still kind of want that feeling. Mm -hmm. And I can feel the nausea associated with it and I can feel the fogginess and the wanting to sort of get lost and the, and the, the ease of irresponsibility mm. and the pleasure of it. And so... I can feel all of that and recognize, okay, I can, if I can bring meta to this and I can bring meta to the, to the thing that's trying to destroy it, then I have more room to integrate all of it. And so that kind of process has gotten me a lot of mileage. Now that said, like, this, is, um, this is step two. And step one is something like... Um, it's actually, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recursive iteration of what I just described. It's just more accessible. Um, it's more reliably accessible to most people most of the time, including me, which is uh, to give myself permission to not do the goddamn work and just blaze myself out and be kind of a jerk sometimes, even to myself. And just like, you know, I have my limits. I'm just gonna watch Netflix. Yep, I'm chewing myself out for for uh, for being for that little glimmer of an inclination for wanting to flirt with that girl that way, and yep, I'm going to think of myself as a fuckhead about that. That's just where I'm at, and now I'm going to go and stuff my face with ice cream because that's where I'm at. Hmm. So, like, the, because if um, the at some point I have to be willing to bring permission where there is an effort to engage in one of the parasitic loops. Hmm. If I can bring permission to any layer, this will melt the layers all the way down eventually. Hmm. But it requires patience. I have to be willing to go even days on uh, spinning out with things like, yeah, like that, that person who sent me that email, they were so unreasonable and I'm being so unreasonable by thinking this way and I should be more spiritually advanced than this. And, <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to just stare at this cartoon show for hours. God, I feel awful. Maybe I'll go masturbate now. Uh, you, know, you know, and just noticing I don't like any of this. If I can bring even the smallest hint of, and that misery matters and I care. Well, then why aren't I revolutionizing it? Yeah, that really does suck. Ah. Uh, Okay, that's all I can take, more Netflix. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so by doing that, I'm giving myself permission to have 
the, the tiny drops of sacred medicine that I can actually stand to take. Mm -hmm. Rather than insisting that it be all or nothing, I'm just letting myself have whatever I can take. And that eventually builds this upward spiral where there's more and more and more that I can do that with. And I have more and more and more of a baseline of just permission to be what I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does this feel like it's answering your question? Like it's it speaking, does. Like it's it the does. right category. <laughs> I th absolutely, absolutely. It still feels like it will be hard for me, but it's helpfully specific. I think part of it is uh, things I heard were like noticing different aspects of yourself that there's multiple parts or layers, and then also um, compassion for those parts. Not not just meta, but compassion, accepting them as they are, and allowing them to be like witness their suffering and then also um th that permission is important like permission to be exactly where you are and even make mistakes or uh fall into patterns or things like that that that's actually like giving that permission is somehow key to unwinding it eventually yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think there's there's a piece that's um that's in the background that i can i I get the sense that you're catching, but it seems worthwhile to mm -hmm. articulate. Please. Um, when the, the difference between this sense of permission to be how you are and the thing that I was saying before, if I, this is so annoying to phrase it this way, give yourself permission to be all of these ways, including this, like, because now you can, I imagine you can hear how like, it's like the right words, but somehow it conveys the wrong thing. Like just magically give permission to have the thing that you can't stand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the key distinction here is being absolutely honest with yourself about the truth of what you actually can do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's this weird twist that it's, it's, it's part of the stupefying parasitic mimetic structure type is part of the foundation of culture where um, we treat should as real. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I, like, well, you shouldn't have yelled at her. But if I was overwhelmed and uh, it was the only option that seemed available to me given my reactive state and like, and that there was a reason I yelled and if I didn't yell, I was paying a different kind of cost or maybe it actually wasn't even another option. Maybe I actually couldn't stop myself. And it was like basically a physiological reaction because I was possessed. But like, given all this, like, what, what do you mean I shouldn't have yelled? Hmm. I think what you mean is something like I should have magically been more mature than I was. Hmm. I agree that would have been good if it could have happened. But now you're talking about some fantasy that wasn't real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you want to use this to blame me in order to make me behave differently without giving me any different tools, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So yes. it's, it's just a, a cluster of pain, right? So the, uh, if you're really realistic, and when I say realistic, there's zero blame, there's zero shame. If you get this right, it's like looking at an engine. Mm -hmm. It's a fact about what you can or can't do, mm -hmm. absolute fact. Uh, most people cannot exercise. I don't know about most people. Most people cannot start an exercise program mm -hmm. or maybe they can start it, but they can't keep with it. Mm. And when I say they can't keep with an exercise program, not because it's outside of their physical capabilities, but because what it would take for them to stay with an exercise program is outside of their range of what they in fact can do. Mm. Right? So if you can see, if, if you're looking at yourself noticing, like uh, I bet that your uh, your situation with food probably and and feeding yourself more probably falls into this category. I remember us having, like you talked about this when we mm -hmm. met up in Seattle a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's this question, like which is not to be answered with the mind here. It's just like pointing attention in a certain direction. Why don't you eat enough? Mm -hmm. There's a cause, right? And so uh, now I don't know this part of your internal structure in much detail, but I could imagine a version of you, because I've seen this type of pattern plastered over almost everybody everywhere, <laughs> which has some version of, I should eat more mm -hmm. and I'm not, 
which makes me bad to the extent that I'm not eating enough. So I'm going to use the pain of this me being bad to motivate myself because if I were to eat enough, I would stop being bad and that would alleviate the pain. Mm. So I will use that image to drive myself to eat more. Oh, that doesn't seem to be working because you aren't dealing with the reason why you aren't eating more anyway. The reason is still there. I can't seem to get myself to do that. Uh, I guess maybe if I amplify the pain signal more by the fact that I'm really messing up here, I'm screwing up, I've been trying at this and I'm really working at it, but I keep failing, ow, ow. And this gets into the Calvinist thing. At least now you are uh, purging yourself of sin through the effort, right? Um, right? So that that entire structure um, it, it doesn't work for creating change. And, and once, if you can see what I'm talking about, if you can feel what I'm talking about, it becomes obvious why. Right? You're pitting your pain against an intelligent system that you're not conscious of, that is trying to maintain a certain goal. Mm -hmm. And you're not dialoguing, you're just trying to force. So now you have an internal arms race where one side is racking up internal pain and the other side is doing whatever the hell I, out, off stage. Usually this results in collapse because this, the, the inner thing that you can't see is tracking something that's actually important. Not to mm. say you shouldn't, you, you, not to say that your idea of how much you should be eating is wrong, although maybe it's wrong. Um, but that like there's, there's usually in this kind of situation, there's something meaningful that it's tracking, like, but I'm not loved enough mm -hmm. or, uh, but then mom will leave me. Like there might be some piece that's hidden like that in the background that actually needs to be addressed. So if you can actually, I want to say compassionately, but compassion makes it seem like there's a problem that you need to bring compassion about. There's no problem. There's just a fact. For somebody in this kind of situation, the fact is they can't actually adhere to their mind's idea of what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. right? So if you can get really clear about what you can and cannot do as a matter of fact. And then you look at where you can bring acceptance of yourself. Even if it's only for a moment, even if it's only, I accept that I am having this conversation right now. I can do that much and no more. Mm -hmm. Great, that's true. And by doing that, that builds a capacity. Okay. The, the way that people get caught up with things like, but I've got this part of me that's just nasty and awful. It, like it just wants to rip into people because it feels strong when it does so. And that's not caring and compassionate. And I want to be a caring, compassionate person. So how do I get rid of this demon inside of me? I just accept it. How do I accept something that's evil? Well, what you're saying is you've got this part in you and it is outside of your capacity to accept it. Mm -hmm. That's just true. At least now you can accept that this is true, mm -hmm. right? And that gives your it gives a, gives your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of uh, mentally translating acceptance to, or, or adding adding the like as an additional word to describe equanimity, which is one of the Brahma Viharas as well. I think acceptance is sort of a functionally useful word here, but uh, I'm just tracking that connection. Yeah, I guess I guess it is closely related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess I'm using one Brahma Vihara to speak in another. <laughs> oh, they're all they're all very mutually supportive. So, uh, yep. Whew. This feels like open heart surgery here. So, it's good. Yeah, it's this good. is deep stuff, and I'm I'm enjoying this. Yes. I wonder if there's anything else that you would like to say more about or converse more about. There's, um, oh, there's, well, there's a, there's a couple of, of uh, things that, that come to mind that if there's uh, juice for it that I can um, certainly go into. Uh, the main one's coming to mind is this um, 
Oh, so one, one piece I, I didn't really go into in describing the stuff with mimetics um, is uh, the way that this unfolds at a global scale mm, mm -hmm. and what that feels like to participate in. Mm. Um, uh, and, and this is all theoretical, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's unclear to me whether, whether there is, there's juice in this conversation right now for going into that, but if you're really enthusiastic, I certainly could. Yeah, definitely. Um, that sounds really interesting. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, par part of the reason that it's important, I mean, there's a lot of reasons it's important. Like, so it's the clarifying memes, the symbiotic ones, Actually, I, I, I never referred to these as symbiotic and parasitic before, but it's a, that's actually a very, very clean way of describing the, the actual difference between them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I might just start adopting that. that Seems phrase. good. Yeah, so the, the symbiotic ones, um, because of their propagation strategy, uh, they have to reveal what they're doing in order, in order to be able to propagate. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to find where, where the center is to, to describe this. So, right, so, so when, when you and I are talking, um, the center of, of your experience as a Tashim is right there. And the center of my experience is over here. Where is the center of the experience of the conversation? Hmm. Okay. And this is, this is um, in some sense, it sounds like a stupid philosophy question, but it's actually related to something very important. Um, like, what does it mean for you to be Tashin as opposed to uh, the community that is this heart and liver and the brain? And the brain is, has all of these like different neuronal clusters that are all doing their own kind of thing. And, you know, it's like, there's, there's a very real biological way in which Tashin as an emergent being emerges as a super system from the systems of that, that make up Tashin's body. Okay. So what would a sane kind human race as an entity look like? How would it function? And I think there's a hint of this when you look at things like, uh, what is a really functional relationship between two people, friendship, romantic relationship, whatever, if it's really deeply, and when I say functional, I mean something uh, almost technical. Um, I mean something that is based in symbiotic means, where like mo most relationships, um, are, uh, are actually based on parasitic means feeding off of each other. Right? And they're able to get into a particular dynamic loop and they're able to breed. So like literally you can get people together to have sex, have children, and then propagate the memes into the children. Hmm. And the dynamics by which they do so are um, very much based on propagating pain structures. Right? There's something very interesting about um, like the, the pattern where adult children of alcoholics keep dating abusive partners. It's like, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. What's up with that? Um, so, uh, but the same thing happens in friendships where a lot of friendships are actually built on um, uh, let's hook each other with the sense of I'm not okay unless you're a certain way. You're not okay unless I'm a certain way. So how about we make a deal where I'll do the things that you need me to do and you'll do the things where that... Um, I need you to do. And so if, uh, and that way we can both be fine together or we can both be fucked together if one of us seems to trip on our deal. Hmm. And, then, and then the way we sort this out is we get upset at each other and we throw blame back and forth. And then you get the herpes flare up of some other kinds of memetic structures. And, uh, and then this reinforces the pain nodes underneath to maintain the nature of the relationship. Or maybe it breaks off because you can't stand each other and then you go find other friends that are similar in the same kind of way that people keep dating the same problem in different people. Hmm. So this, this parasitic thing is the basis of uh, most human relationships. 
Um, and this is actually a, a pretty significant point. I hammer a fair bit uh, in Mage when people start really cleaning up their social connections, because uh, as you start making it more symbiotic, uh, you may actually find that a lot of the people in your life fall away because, or they may get really pissed at you and upset and concerned for you and try to grab you and suck you back into these patterns. And if that doesn't work, some of them may go away um, because what they were in for was actually being in mutual self-possession or in mutual possession, rather codependence. Uh, and when you stop being codependent, then they're not, they're actually not interested in the relationship with you. They were interested in the relationship with your codependence. Hmm. And it's a very painful thing to come to discover, but you learn how to hold it. You learn how to navigate it and recognize, no, I only want relationships that are actually human to human beneath the mimetic structures. So um, what that reveals, so if you imagine instead what a, what a marriage would be like in a predominantly symbiotic mimetic atmosphere, you end up with these kinds of dynamism where there is un, un, I wanna say unquestionable same-sidedness. But what I mean by unquestionable is not, we're on the same side no matter what and I'll never let my partner down, which is anxiety-based, it's pain-based. It's like you're, like you're trying to suppress the parts of you that might want to do otherwise. But instead it's, we're putting everything on the table for each other. And we are working together to meet all of our desires. So if there's ever any place where there's non-transparency, the question doesn't become, why did you hide this from me? It becomes, oh, why did you need to hide this? Let's see what we can meet. So at that point, what you have is something like the relationship itself becomes this emergent thing that, ex that lives through both of the people in the relationship, but is a third thing that serves each of the people and is made of their desires and their clarity. So where it, it, you, you'd have a hard time saying where the center of consciousness is spatially, but it starts to make sense to say that the relationship is making decisions. Mm -hmm. This is reminding me that um, I don't know if my experience of this is exactly like you're describing it, but I think how to put this. The way I've described it before is that increasingly I find it less useful to identify as Tashin over here in this body, uh, in this mind, and more as like, for example, in this conversation, like it's Tashin and Michael speaking. And yes, like, I don't know, it still seems to be located experientially over here, but like this mind, this conversation, yes. this interaction is meaningfully different in a way that I can feel into and lean into and act on and trust that's different than if I was speaking with someone else or if someone else was here or something like that. It's, it has a different flavor and I am attuned to that kind of capacity more and more. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, this brings in a, a really, a really curious element of um, the reason that it's going to be difficult to say where the center of this conversation's consciousness is, mm -hmm. is because when you ask that question in an absolute way, you're asking from a third person point of view that doesn't actually exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no one observing the conversation from outside of it, witnessing, right? And you could add a theoretical person, like, we, like there are people listening to this podcast, I imagine. In the <laughs> future, just after we've published. Right. Yes. Right. And for them, it would seem like, well, I don't know where, like, like where is the center? Um, but uh, what I'm, that's, uh, that, that's a quirk of how I phrased it. What I'm, what I'm pointing at is, um, there is no absolute answer to where the center is, but there is a relative answer. Hmm. And the relative answer is that is, is the same as what you're describing. You're saying it's not very helpful to think of Tashin over there and Michael over here and 
um, separate and separate having this conversation, but instead that uh, we is conversing. Yeah, yeah, yes. And the method by which we is conversing speaks through Michael and Tashin. Mm -hmm. But in order for that to make any sense at all, there have to be perspectives of Michael and Tashin that mm -hmm. are separate. Mm -hmm. And so from the Tashin perspective, the center of the conversation is in Tashin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And does that include, because one of the ways I really experience this is that the, the we that is being discussed right now is different than like the we I would have in a different conversation. Yeah. Yeah, the same way that when I say I am metta, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's that quality of if I am metta, who am I? Mm -hmm. if, if you are also metta, then who is talking yeah it, it, is kindness it, talking to itself this feels conversationally tangential but important to say right here in this moment cool. which is um there was an experience i had once um i had taken acid actually and i, I there's a specific tweet that i wrote on this acid trip that i i'll link to it's it's the the one that i believe um we are the universe trying to understand it or itself uh I choose to believe people are fundamentally good. I choose to believe the universe is fundamentally good. That tweet, um, I think there's a fourth clause that I'm forgetting in this moment. But anyway, on that trip, um, I had an experience of like, oh man, I, I would love to go in great detail into this trip and talk to you about it. But um, it, if I've had an awakened experience, it was this was the closest one to it ever, which was just like, you know, the sort of like laughing because it's so simple sort of thing. It was just like, oh, all I have to do is be here yeah. sort of thing. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the fourth clause. All there is to do is, is to be present and loving in this moment. And there's, and I think there might be another word that I use there. I'll have to look it up. But um, all there is to do is be present and loving. And I remember looking at myself in the mirror and seeing a person that was this love. and. I wouldn't have described it that way at the time, but it was like the most loving, kind, pure, sweet, gentle love that I've ever seen. And it's almost like that was more me than this person that's speaking right now or, uh, you know, and I don't, it's like, oh, I get a glimpse of what that is. And I'm more or less able to embody that at a given time, but I don't know how to consistently purely embody that and like I imagine that will unfold through the rest of my life and when it does when I like am able to like pretty consistently be that person it's like he whoo and, and and he loved himself too that was really clear it was like not just other people it was like love for everybody uh yep yeah is this is this making oh, any sense beautiful. to you it's making perfect sense to me that is uh -huh. That is gorgeous. I don't claim to have attained or whatever, but I think I have had this experience quite a lot, and I, and I get I get glimpses. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. Yes, beautiful. and well, and and importantly, yeah, yeah, not not an attainment. It was very clear. It's just like a simple, like everything that's in the way of that is removed. Not not a add on or a, you yeah. know, unlocking or something. I was like, no, no, this is. I'm just covering this up somehow. A lot of the time with this sort of thing, you know, <laughs> whatever this is. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know what the covering up is really about, but yeah, the, the way that I usually think about it is, um, I, um, I wanted to say obviously I am perfect, but what I what I mean by that is uh, God is perfect, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just that it doesn't. Anyway, there, there's there's a language glitch here that I don't know how to get around because it implies weird social stuff. Um, but we'll just say God is perfect and is breaching compassionately through Michael in order for God to experience himself as Michael, but also at the same time, this is like ident identical to providing uh, compassion, relief, kindness to and through Michael, mm. which is the same thing as God experiencing itself as Michael. Yes. And like having that, so th there's this element almost like Michael uh, 
it, it, it's hard to get around the, the almost like the Calvinist frameworks here. Um, I don't think this has the emotional jabby element, but maybe it's snuck in. I'll find out when I say it. Um, that uh, like, like Michael has some kind of distortions in his clarity by which God can come through. And that's not a description of Michael's worth. It's definitely not a description of God's worth. It's just a fact. And the act of working on that brings this relief and clarity and that the, the distortion is that kind of like fucked up covering thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the act of providing relief can result in some kind of weird turbulence that is part of what Michael will sometimes identify with forgetting that Michael is God slash the animal. Hmm. Okay. So there's, there's a little bit of paradoxicalness that I recognize. I have, like my mind hasn't sorted all of this out by any means. I don't know that it can, um, but there's a very clear element of um, identifying as a person who has a body hmm. that is living this life is a kind of insanity. Hmm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it it does not make sense because where is the consciousness coming from hmm. like and when you when you trace the consciousness it doesn't make any sense did you, you experience like, yeah. any of what you just said as jabby if you take a second to look at it uh the main it's a, it's just unclear i don't Thinks, I don't notice anything, Jeff. For me, I just just because I'm like trying out the thing that you I've been asking you about for this whole conversation. Uh, to me, the first awesome. part didn't feel jabby, but then when you said it was insane, that felt jabby to me. Oh, oh, I agree. The word insane. Yeah, that's felt a good jabby. catch. I was, I was, yes, that is a good catch. Thank you. I actually didn't catch that one. Hmm. I okay. So uh, switching gears slightly. Uh, I noticed, let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm act, in what I'm about to say, I'm also trying to deploy the thing I've been asking, been asking you about to the best of my current ability, which is nascent. Uh, let's That's see. That's beautiful. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, this will be a tricky speech act because I'm like trying to deploy it. So bear with me here while I say it. Earlier, we were talking about metta and loving kindness and the Brahma Viharas. And uh, I was asking about and showing and revealing that it's difficult for me to love myself. You, 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 you suggested that and I confirmed it and we dive deeper into that. Um, let's see. When we were speaking about that, when you were speaking about that, and I was asking questions, I experienced discomfort because um, it seemed like, I think I was importing this perhaps, I'm, I'm not sure, but it seemed like a conclusion of what was being described would be work on my stuff and then, uh, and then go and help other people or something like that. Like clean out the Tashin system, just clean that out, and then help other people. Stop helping other people now. Clean yourself up, then help people. And I noticed that as a response to that discomfort and that maybe added bit of content, I really wanted you to say something that probably would never even occur to you. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and instead of like trying to manipulate you into saying it, I'm simply going to surface it and say it for myself. And then I'd be curious what you have to say about it. Uh, but mostly just to put it on record and say it towards myself, which is connected to this last thing. Uh, I, yeah, it's, it felt connected to what was just said in a way that I can't put my finger on. Um, that's okay. I think it'll become clear once you say it. Yeah. Uh, as I guess the approach I would prefer to take and that I do take 
and that seems it actually seems better to me i could be deluded but seems better to me is to like just fully show up and actually try my best knowing that i'm imperfect knowing that i'll make mistakes uh even that i might hurt myself or other people because of my limitations and failings and then use um the actual reality of situations and the mistakes I make and the things that I learn to as as sort of grist for the mill to grow rather than isolating myself getting to a point of complete self-love love for all beings and then returning to service uh I think that's how I hold my life is like the the karma yoga is helping other people, but it's also like that is itself the unworking of uh, the opportunity to work through all of these patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm mostly just agree. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm noticing that there's an implication read into what I was talking about that uh, wasn't what I meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, but I think it's a reasonable assumption given given what was actually said. Um, I, uh, um, I didn't mean like sit in a room and just clean out this stuff until you're perfect and then go interact with the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I actually think that that is mostly, um, there, there, there are two errors that I can see, like two, two error directions. One is, uh, essentially procrastination on your spiritual life, which is where you, uh, where you, uh, sit in isolation and meditate forever, waiting to become uh, ripe for interacting with the world. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying this is always wrong to do, but I think that it's often wrong for most people. Like it will, um, it will not lead to a, a great place. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, uh, the other side is where you try to show up, but you aren't tracking where the drive to show up is coming from, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Which means that you're predominantly the puppet of the parasitic means while insisting that you're not. Uh, we'll be using fragments of um, mimetic literacy in order to demonstrate how you are actually free of mm. these mimetic things. And if you think otherwise, then fuck you. Mm. Um, and like sort of missing a bunch of the subtleties that are going on in terms of like the the reason like most of the reason most people feel a need to go out there and show up mm -hmm. sorry i was about to say something false the the loudest drive most people are aware of actually comes from pain mm -hmm. there is a true thing which is as a glorious soul living this life showing up in connection and compassion with others and being of service to the unfolding is joy mm -hmm. And that's what we want to experience because we want to experience ourselves. And like, that's just radiantly true. There's nothing to finagle. There's nothing to force. It's just true. Mm -hmm. So if you can feel that truth of who you are, clearly you will want to show up. Mm -hmm. Even with imperfections and glitches, even with parasites going around and flaring up with their herpes thing and blah, blah, like that. They, even with all of that, you'll still want to show up. And what will happen is in the course of contact with reality in contact with the effort to show up, the whole reason why you're here, if there's a reason at all, you end up seeing what cleanup matters mm -hmm. and why mm -hmm. it matters because you're coming from a pure place in order to orient to the work. So I, I mean that, that middle one. Mm -hmm. I definitely mm -hmm. mean that middle one. Um, I, uh, I don't see... Um, I occasionally see people doing some pretty, um, pretty uh, powerful, useful stuff in the reclusive approach, um, but it, it runs into the danger of, well, when are you done? Mm -hmm. And uh, also the, the reason for a reclusive approach in part is to have a mimetic moat mm -hmm. so that the environment that you are growing your mimetic structures in is fairly well contained. Uh, but if that environment itself is not sufficiently mimetically literate, Mm -hmm. then you end up deepening some parasitic structures mm. and you end up spending 20 or 40 years getting that really deep into your system. And now you're bringing a very specific 
corruption into the world with lots of prep preparation as well, mm. which doesn't put you in that much better a position as you would have if you had just jumped in and interacted with the world to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yes. So, uh, pros and cons, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, and not to dismiss the value of that kind of approach where you really go, no, let me really clean it out. I see things that need cleaning out mm -hmm. and I'm done infecting the world with my stuff. I'm just going to go take care of this. Mm -hmm. um, the, the place where I see this most often creating slippage is when a person is getting a sense of meaning or value from helping others rather than from their own existence and that existence resulting in a natural desire to help others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a very subtle difference, but to me it is, it is all the difference because that changes the entire, um, it, it changes the soil of your mimetic garden and mm -hmm. defines which kind of meme is more likely to grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's fascinating, this stuff about, uh reclusive path and like being in the world and stuff and um yeah just to be clear I, I i think when i checked i was like oh i'm not i don't i don't think you're saying this but i noticed it was like tempting to add that on if that makes sense and and then that that like yeah. there's a whole emotional complex of things for me so uh, yeah. I, yeah i think you, you did a pretty good job by my read of bringing bringing that forward without a lot mm -hmm. of hooking or stuff the um the main thing was something like uh uh, you occurred to me as um, wanting to wrap what you were doing in enough caveats to make sure that I was okay with how you said it. Mm. Mm. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. Like, I, I had this thing, but I could be wrong. But and I just want to say this piece here, and to like that, like that, that piece of the energy. That was the only thing mm. that I caught that felt a little funny. Hmm. The part that I experienced most as funny was just, and I noticed, well, I definitely had to close my eyes to say 80% of that, but also uh, was it felt very um, conceptually complicated. Uh, like I had to, I don't know, probably there was a simpler way to say that, but it, it was like, oh, I can only say this in a very complicated way. I, I don't know. I, I think that that might, the part, to the extent that that's what you're saying is true, my experience of that is that's more habitual than like, oh, I was actively worried that I'd hurt you from what I said or something. Right. Yeah. So where's yeah. the habit from? Uh, oh, <laughs> speculate about that if you want to. <laughs> Family stuff, no, the, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't actually care about the the, the stories. I'm, I'm just pointing at a thing, which yeah. is, uh, if if you have a habit that's well worn into your system, and the habit carries a particular kind of energy, mm -hmm. that suggests that the habit was put there by that energy. Mm -hmm. So if you trace, not not necessarily well, here is the story of where this came from, because that's getting more lost in the mind. Um, but like th this is part of how I do mimetic tracing. I'll zoom in on wait, where did this come from? Not what stories can my mind generate for where did this come from? I'm asking if I look at it and I follow its energetic trail, like it had a cause and effect chain that resulted in this, what do I see? Like a feeling to a thought, to a feeling or a speech act or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and sometimes this will end up tracing through time as well. So I'll be able to feel through time and go, oh, mm -hmm. it came through this. And then it's helpful to notice, oh, it's because of this interaction with my parents or this dynamic in my family resulted in this. Huh. But then what you're starting to do is examine, like, it's not about telling a story. It's about tracing the life cycle of a meme. If you can follow the life cycle and follow its mutations, if there were any, then you can see what it does when it clears up in a lot more detail and it feels less like it's you. Hmm. Hmm. What's the experiential difference between that and what you're talking about of going into your mind and telling a story about things? Um, the most default thing that I see is people lose track of their bodies. I see. Um, they're, they're going into, like if you, like when I watch people who have gone through a lot of therapy, but somehow are not getting better. Uh -huh. I, the kind of pattern that I see them going into is stuff like um, 
oh yeah, sure. And then I get really anxious in this kind of situation because my mom did this thing to me when I was this, when I was a little kid and that was really stressful. And I've been carrying that throughout my whole life. And, and so that shows up in this kid situation and blah, 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 blah. Like, okay, great. Your uh -huh. mind has a great story, a great picture of what's going on. And when you ask your mind for a story of why you rearrange the pencils in this way, it will produce a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is dramatically different from, in, in essence, from this. And I, 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 the one thing I can point at in terms of the actual experiential difference between the two, it's very clear is um, the, the in the head version almost always comes with disembodiment. Right. When and then, sucked and into telling the story. Whereas it, it, I'm remembering having the experience of like, oh, being with the body, being with the experience, being present, and then a memory arises. You often, often, often with like surprise, you're like, where did, oh, wow, I'd forgotten about this or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. And importantly, the, um, the memory doesn't have to take you out of your body, even mm -hmm. though it explodes in your awareness. Mm -hmm. You can still be here and remembering. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let me ask you about something else. I, I'm there's there was something I was connecting the dots with much earlier in the conversation about uh, the way that these memes play out on a larger scale beyond the individual. And there's a thought that I've had for a while that I want to see if it tracks with your experience and, and the way that you think mm -hmm. about these things, which is um, so I try to hold myself on my Twitter account to Buddhist right speech as I understand it and practice it which is iterative it's not uh of course yeah but that that's a practice for me and it seems to me so i have i have the twemex extension which i quite like do you use that i don't know what it is the if anyone extension. yeah it's an, a chrome extension for twitter uh which is great uh, yeah if anyway people should know more about it because it's really good and um that's besides the point but one of the features that it has is uh, for example, if you're on someone's profile, like whether it's your own or someone else, it shows you like what their most popular tweets are, for example. And that's yeah. kind of um, given me almost uh, almost a kind of situational awareness of my own tweets or other people's tweets. And I've noticed a really interesting pattern, which is that, um, how to put it? Oh, I'm wanting to qualify that I don't care about this intrinsically. I'm just aware of it. But anyway, here we are. Uh, so, so say 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 I have an account. I don't know. I currently have I don't know like 5,500 followers or something. There could be someone else that has a similar number of followers. But in general, other people, even people with less followers, tend to have much higher likes. Even sometimes accounts with like 50 followers have one or two tweets that's like, oh, this is like 20,000 likes or something. And um, it seems to me, my my internal hypothesis, well, one, one could be like, oh, I'm just bad at tweeting or something. I don't think that's the case. Um, I think that the internal constraints that I put on myself about speech preclude a lot of kinds of tweets that might be more hooky uh, yeah. for people and spread more easily. Yeah. Does that seem yeah. plausible to you? That seems spot on. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I, I don't know about your situation in particular, but um, generally my experience has been that, I mean, this, this falls out of the, of the mimetic structures. It's also matching my personal experience. Other people have talked about this. Like, I, I think it was, was it C.P. Gray? I don't quite remember. I think it was C.P. Gray. Who, uh, who did the video, this video will make you angry, mm -hmm. um, where he talks about, it's, act, he, it's actually a great intro to memetics, to, mm -hmm. to evolutionary memetics. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't, I don't think he quite describes it that way. He talks about what kinds of articles end up spreading and how the articles get modified in order to spread better mm -hmm. and what the kinds of pressures are that cause that. And they systematically drift towards making people mad Yes, because that, that rewards the reward structure the right way or follows yes. the reward structure the right way. So there is something about in the parasitic mimetic civilization, control of attention is based on what can alarm you in the right way. 
alarm you the most in the right way, where right is about like in alignment with a particular means propagation methods. So um, this this result this this is part of why we have outrage porn. It's and and the culture wars are basically made of this, where like the um, you you would only need like one percent of the population. I, I'm making up the, the number, but you only need a very small proportion of the population to um, to actually be that possessed in order to result in something that's visibly a culture war and make it feel like it's everywhere, because those are the ones that get spread all over the place and dominate the conversation. Um, so it could very well be like it would be kind of a funny twist if it turned out that um, we're on the verge of universal. Um, uh, bodhisattvahood, but it just doesn't look that way because the, the people who are busy hammering the drum of samsara are really loud, <laughs> right? And there's like, there's like a, a one million of them on earth, you know? Like, uh -huh. <laughs> you know? So um, I doubt that that's the case that we actually have, but like, huh. it would look similar, which huh. is interesting. Huh. Huh. So, um, <clears throat> or could look similar, I should say. So um, yeah, so if you end up with these constraints on speech, and I have, I have something similar, it's not as rigid, but um, for myself, there's an element of, I do not want to exercise the, um, uh, the life cycle of the parasitic, para, parasympathetic, Christ, I meant parasitic, the parasitic means in me which is, that's not how I usually think of it. Normally I, I think of it in terms of, oh, there's this energy of pain and I don't want to practice distracting myself from it. I would rather be with it in myself. Mm -hmm. I don't want to practice demanding that others change their behavior in order to soothe me. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to be in my own center and speak the truth. So that's one of the, the main constraint I have on my speech when I'm out in public doing stuff most of the time is, Am I speaking from adult to adult? Mm -hmm. Or am I adding some kind of hook? Mm -hmm. I want mm -hmm. to be hookless. So this has the disadvantage that I that you're describing. I think it's the same kind of thing, which is that um, it doesn't yank people by their egos. Mm -hmm. And if says everybody is for the most part in this ego-driven society, that's the thing that like that, that means that it ends up not getting as much acclaim. But it does come with the nice advantage that um, uh, what I do, and I think the same thing seems to apply to you, what you do, ends up being untouchable. Mm -hmm. right? Because it's um, like, I think it would be stressful, but uh, see, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to describe this. Like, um, like, you are considerably less cancelable than most people. I think I am actually uncancelable. Mm. And by that, I don't mean that, um, I don't mean that cancel culture couldn't turn its eye of Sauron on either of us. Mm. Um, what, I, what I mean is the impact, I mean, there would be some, some energy to digest. So I know that for me, if, uh, if someone dug up something and that they decided this is totally unforgivable, and I'm sure if they decided they were going to, they could totally do it. Um, if they dug up something, and said, hey, look, this Michael Smith guy, he claims he's doing all this stuff, but look at him. He mm. did this back in 2008. Fuck him forever, cancel, boom. Then like, for one thing, I would, most of my experience would, like there would be some sense of, okay, I guess God has decided that I shall now train. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right. You know, like, I will now learn how to channel this much lightning. Like the inner, right. the inner experience is immune to the external actions that might be even yeah. emotionally painful or something you wouldn't suffer because of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would not change what I am doing out in public as a result of the cancellation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, aside from minor stuff like, oh, looks like I'm being canceled. Oh, we affected you. Yeah, whatever. Uh -huh. But I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for something unless, I, unless it's brought to my awareness and I can recognize, oh, let me separate these two things. There is something here where I was out of alignment and I was too immature at the time to recognize it. So now I can see that I have this impact and yeah, there's sorrow in my heart about that impact and that's true. And I choose to be different from how I was then. That is a separate issue from the fact that this canceling is insane and I do not condone it. 
I'm not going to follow through on it. I'm not going to feed it. Y'all enjoy your rave. You can hate me to the ends of the earth. I can be the devil. Hate me forever. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You can't control me. Mm. So um, that where that comes from, like that, that capacity in myself comes from the same place that puts the restriction on my speech in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's not really a restriction. It's actually a compassion to myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hurt. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. about I not practice speech that hurts me? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This is making me think that, um, huh, how to put this? If it came about that I wrote a tweet that say had 20,000, 100,000 likes or something like that, or whatever, either, most likely, most likely that means I would have failed and accidentally said something that was like very hurtful or something, or like hooked into the, the thing, anything, uh, or I would have found, yeah, basically like a, a symbiotic meme that was like very good and was immune to a lot of these things. That would be a success. That, that's maybe part of why I care. It's like, I would love to write something that was just like purely of the spirit of meta that touched many people and was like beautiful and good and just like wholesome and yeah. pure of, you know, um, and yeah, I, I don't know, maybe this is me trying to feel good in my own system, but like, that's, that's my service project, you know, like, yeah, this is, yeah. so yeah. Uh, we'll see. I don't know if, if, and when the day comes where there's so far, so far, it seems like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, most of the tweets that I've written are, uh, neither of those things, you know, they, they, they are like meaningfully beautiful to the, pe the people that happen to read them or something like that. Yeah. 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 I think, um, my most liked post, if I remember right, was when I said, okay, everyone, time for shadow meta. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. I just started hammering meta from the dark, yes. which is like, I, I think I kept it reasonably clean, but like, yes. it, was, it was still something like, let's honor uncleanliness. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And like, that's what spreads. And uh -huh. I'm like, okay, yes. that's okay. unsurprising. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. It's an interesting light. It's almost, it's almost, uh, I don't know. I have a, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun thing for me to explore. Like, because I don't, for me, when I put the constraints on, it's like, like anything else with constraints, like, it's like what, um, it opens up possibilities of like playing a game of like, okay, if these are the rules and I, as I understand them, as I try to follow them myself, like what is the most beautiful, helpful, interesting, valuable speech act I could make within these constraints. So, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'm really appreciating. Um, I, I think I'm still beginning to learn this sort of thing from you, but it's, it feels like from our two conversations that we've really had, I don't know, it feels like I've gotten like a, a bite of the meal you're trying to offer the world. And that feels very helpful. So appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. I'm glad you want to eat it. Yes. It is. Yes. Um, there's uh there's something of, to the extent that I, uh, I take my own medicine, so to speak, um, a lot of my pride and joy is related exactly to how much these symbiotic memes really spread. And the, it feels like the main ones that uh, seem to naturally channel through me are about being conscious of these mimetic structures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very self-referential, but it's... Um, uh, I think that's part of the beauty of it, mm -hmm. but it's but but feeling uh, somebody wants to see it for themselves and getting pieces of it. That is, it's very personally gratifying, in a in a fascinating way because it, it, it um, sure it has something to do with what Michael did, and technically it does mean something about Michael's abilities. Mm. Um, but there's there's a deeper sense, which is uh, this quality of I am both Michael and being, mm. and uh, it seems very clear through this Michael mind that being wants to be understood through human minds, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so it feels personally gratifying to the big me. As well. <laughs> yes, beautiful. 
beautiful well and and that's that's um that's why i love recording these as well it feels increasingly i really feel like these conversations are like first and foremost primarily my own education like this is like the school that i get to have that is just for, particularly for this person at this time uh but because it's recorded it's like if i then other people can learn the same thing go to the same school that i'm attending so thank you for teaching sensei at the school of Tasha. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh.